wrecking yard. I met my true love down in the wrecking yard. I met my true love called a wreck Chevrolet. Which I see every day. belongs to me She don't come from no town She don't come from no city She lives way down in Diddy Wah, Diddy, Diddy Wah Hi, welcome to episode 5 of the Wrecking Yard podcast featuring Members of the last four digits, Dave Fulton and Mike Sheets. Now, this was a fun, fun podcast for me to do. These two guys have been uh, uh, two of my closest friends since the late 70s. We were sort of com- early compadres in the uh, burgeoning Indianapolis punk scene. And by burgeoning, I mean there were only about five of us. Uh, anyway, Dave, uh, so Dave was in uh, one of the very earliest of the punk bands in town, the Joint Chiefs of Staff which eventually became the last four digits with some other bands scattered in between there. Mike Sheets was involved also in the last four digits and some of the other some of the other projects and he was also a founding member of the legendary Cheeses from France, which if you want to know more about, and who wouldn't, you go to the wreckingyard.com or the wrecking yard. I'm sure if you Google it you'll get there. Or if you go to the Facebook page there's a direct link to the site. You can learn all about the cheeses from France, as well as see some of the video accompaniment that goes with some of these podcasts. So uh, Dave and Mike and I went to an incredible amount of shows over a short amount of time. We also had uh, several trips out to New York. Me and Dave uh, went out to San Francisco, all the while seeing as many bands as we could. We were also really, really obsessed with uh, the public image metal box. I remember our trip to New York where we listened to virtually nothing else for the entire trip. So obsessed were we that during the song chant, the vocals that are being manipulated in the background, we had sort of a, not an argument, but a running disagreement as to whether he was saying love, war, fear, hate, or if he was saying we're here to make trouble while somebody messed with the volume pots. So we actually got together and sent a telegram to Tom Snyder. Remember the old Tom Snyder show that used to come on after The Tonight Show? We found out Public Image was going to be on there, and we sent them a telegram asking him to please ask them what the chant was. Of course, we just got sort of a smart-ass answer, and that was it. I think eventually we found out it was love, war, fear, hate, probably on an Internet search of some sort. But anyway... So Dave went on, after his initial foray into the music world, Dave went on to become a very successful videographer and just recently an Emmy Award winning filmmaker. Mike Sheets went on to play with Paul Mayhern in the Dandelion Abortion and still plays with Dave in the last four, four digits or the last four, five digits or whatever iteration of the name that they want me to use. That's the band that they're in. And they have a new album coming out. And by new, I put new in quotes because it's stuff that was recorded about 25 or 30 years ago, but it's just now finally seeing the light of day on both vinyl and CD. And we talk about that as well. So I think you're going to find this to be a very lively chat. And I think if you are an Indianapolis native, which I'm sure a lot of you are, you're going to find it very interesting because some of the memories that we have are probably going to intersect with yours. Anyway, this is the last podcast I'm going to post for a couple of weeks. I'm going on a little mission to gather up some more material. And in two two weeks, three weeks, I get back in two and a half weeks. In three weeks, I'll start posting new podcasts with new people who I've talked to while I've been gone. So please be patient. And, you know, these trips are expensive, so if you go to the website and you see that donate button and you think, well, hell, what better person could I give it to? Well, that would be me. So pop something in there if you want to. I have to add that I've had two 
very generous uh, people who have helped make this website possible. The first would be Richard Spilly, who honestly really helped build the foundation of this thing, and Mike Spencer, who made a very generous donation that helped out with this fact-finding trip I am now about to embark on. Thanks, guys. I really, really appreciate it. That's why you got mentioned. I'm going to leave now. I'll check you guys back in two and a half to three weeks. And now you can enjoy the very raucous conversation I had with my friends Dave and Mike. Yeah, we're, 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 you and then and we meet and then all the various things we do. Jesus from France, wheezing combo. Bob Phillips. Sure, Bob Phillips. Um, everything. Whatever you so, want to talk about. Well, all right. Well, You're leading this conversation. We're already going. And so why don't each of you introduce yourselves? Uh, this is Dave Fulton. This is Mike Sheets. That was very good. All right. Now, uh, <laughs> no cue cards. No, you're not going to get them either. Um, now, were you both born here? Are you both from here? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Born in Anderson and lived in Cleveland for a year when I was in kindergarten and then lived back here ever since. I did not know that. Yep. But you've been here your, your whole time? Born and raised in Indianapolis. Yeah, my, my family's been here for three or four generations now. Now, was this up in Carmel or here? Or? No, no, in Indianapolis. I grew up at 51st and Washington Boulevard. And I, uh, I was very familiar with Broad Ripple back when, in the old days when it was just a, a little town. Hippies and ducks. Little Hamlet. Even before the hippies. <laughs> yeah. I mean, really? I remember going to see James Bond movies and, and Jerry Lewis movies at the Vogue at the Theater. Vogue? Yeah, my mom took me to see Bonnie and Clyde there when it came out. I remember that. I was seven. <laughs> <laughs> Little did they know. Yeah. Did that influence you? Not as much as some other things, but yeah, it was a, it was a big one. You know, when they got shot at the end, I mean, that was pretty shocking. In slow motion. That was pretty shocking to a, to a seven-year-old. It was shocking for everyone. And you know, the funny thing was, is I actually saw that movie four or five times. And like, you, within the span of like a year. Have you continued to watch it? I like it a lot, yeah. But, you know, the thing was, it's just, you know, here I am. I probably shouldn't have even seen it the first time. And yet, like, we saw it again at a drive-in. And then I was staying with my aunt and uncle. It just happened. And they went and saw it with us. And, and they were really mad because they didn't want their son to see it. <laughs> they were just like, what? Hey, let you watch this. I'm, well, I'm and you'd already it seen twice. it three or four times. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, um, okay, now, in high school... Actually, let's start. Let's start early. Now, can you trace back, like Dale did, your interest in music to a certain point or a certain probably day the, or the a certain... Beatles on Ed Sullivan? I don't really remember much about music before the Beatles on Ed Sullivan, other than my brother, who was nine years older than me, uh, bought singles, mm -hmm. and he and I still have his collection of forty fives in my closet here. Because curiously, he has no interest in it, so I'm sort of the curator of right. his interest in music. Well, now, I mean, were you allowed to play them, or did you have to sneak them? I sort of listened to him play them. Ah. Uh, the, the only one, the only record I remember playing over and over again was I Want to Hold Your Hand after the Beatles were on Ed Sullivan. And I just, like everyone else, I was just sort of in love with that song. Sure. And uh, we had bunk beds, and so uh, a friend of mine used to sit on the top bunk and pretend he was Ringo. And then I'd, I'd sort of stand in front and, and act like I was one of the other three. <laughs> Or the one who wasn't George. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I love George. So, anyway, yeah, I think like a lot of people my age that that Beatles appearance on Ed Sullivan was kind of a, a defining moment. Right. Mike, was that same, same for you? My earliest, earliest recollection of music was a girl on our block who we were friends with. She collected music, and she had Beatles singles, and we would go over to her house and listen to Beatles singles. Right. And then first recollection of visually, I think was probably more the Rolling Stones on Ed Sullivan. So, but yeah, she, this girl, she would, every anytime she got a new single, she would just ride her little bike down to the house right. and invite me over and we'd go, go listen to them. Well, having a new record back then was a big thing. I mean, I oh, remember yeah. when, when I bought records, I mean, I would, I would clutch those things in the car. They weren't going to leave my hands they until were I got home. Oh, yeah. You know, and, uh, and you know, you'd get them and it was yours. And there you was know? some prestige, too, to being the first person on your block with a new single. Right. Yeah, because, you know, your parents had records, but, you know, once you started getting taste of your own, you didn't want their records. You wanted your records, you know. And, and uh, yeah, so I, I, you know, it was, it was fairly serious. It was the same, the Beatles for me, too, only I was fairly younger than, I was only like 
three, maybe three or four. But I, I but I, I just remember it sounding like nothing I had ever heard before, which is being four would be everything. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and 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 uh, and we had Beatle albums around the house, so my mom's records were actually kind of cool. You know, she also had like Herman's Hermits and. Uh, the stuff that you would expect her to have, maybe a, maybe like a, a Chad and Jeremy album. Or Did something she get like into that. the birds and, and some? Of she the didn't other. get quite that heavy into it, but like we'll talk about later, she didn't really need to because you know the local radio station gave us all of that we needed. That was back when you could turn on the radio and you could hear, you know, Paint It Black and You Really Got Me and you know any one of a thousand really great songs that are still great to this day, and, and, and they just be there like just spilling out. Boom, 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 and you grew boom, up boom. in Indianapolis too, yes. or, or the area, yeah. And my parents listened to only WIFE. That was the only radio station that I even knew existed for probably the first 10 years of my life. I, I mean, occasionally somebody would accidentally get it on WIBC and it automatically sounded like old people to me. And I'd just go, no, turn that back. Because, you know, the, the thing was, is when I started buying a lot, you know, when I started, say, when I was like 17, 18, started listening to a lot of older stuff, I loved it when I'd get an album and I'd put it on, I remember that song. I used to really like that song when I was six on my way to grandma's house, you know, in the car. You know, that was kind of the fun part of it. But yeah, it was, it was really fun because it was there. You didn't have to, you didn't have to search out. It just, it just was in the air. Now, in high school, didn't you, were you on the radio station? In yeah, the, WHJE. In right. Trouble? Yeah. You know, I tried, I, I tried to listen, do that. I listened to that. In, that's, do you really? Yeah, in my car mm-hmm. today. It's WHA. 24 hours stereo. Oh, it's it's awesome. They play the greatest stuff. It's like between that and NPR. Well, back in the day, you might have heard Little Davey Fulton on there with his radio oh, show. Little Davey Fulton. <laughs> and the blooper reel? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. <laughs> well, I was going to let you tell it, but you, you know. <clears throat> um. Yeah, we have, everything was manual back then. It was mono. It was whenever the first person could get there in the morning, and we had two turntables. And I remember when shortly before I started there, they had cart machines, and those came in, and that was like a big wow. deal to have uh-huh. cart machines. <laughs> I have a picture of me somewhere uh, behind the board there that my brother took when he wow. came to visit once. Yeah, my my high school had no artsy. Kind what of high school stuff. was that? That was how. They had no radio station. They had nothing like that. The only thing that they had, which unfortunately, looking back, I never got into, was uh, they had really great musicals. I mean, there was right. they really great plays. Were you ever um, in those? No, that's what I said. I regret never oh. doing it. It was kind of one of those things that I don't remember it even being offered. It was kind of like those people got do it but i don't even know who those people were and then i'd go watch the musicals and it's like god that's really cool you, you know could have been, you well, could have been a contender and they, and they were done really well and they were man they were packed and it was just yeah it was something that just i don't remember it was never ever something that was offered to me and i don't know why carl high school had a planetarium too i mean we could uh we could put on Dark Side of the Moon on the radio station, then walk across the hall to the planetarium and just kind of get high and go, ooh, look at the stars. We had, we had a fairly affluent high school. I guess. Yeah. And it, it's even more so now. It's more it like looks a college, like a college campus. It's like a now. college campus, yeah, and you go back to the football stadium. I did. I drove back there a, a couple years ago when I moved back. I was like, I wonder what it looks like back there now. Because we used to skateboard back there. And, uh, it's all different. It's totally different. It's literally like, I don't see, you know, I think we used to have six minutes to get to class, six minutes maybe. How If you have a class on one end of that building and the next one is on the other, how do you get there in six maybe minutes? Maybe that's where the skateboard came in handy. Oh, I wasn't that good at it, honestly. So, <laughs> Okay, so now when you went to college, you did an exchange program, didn't you? Didn't you spend some time overseas? It wasn't really an exchange program. Ball State. They didn't trade anybody for you? They had a, went? no, I don't think so. Although, <laughs> As much as they might have tried to, <laughs> could they could they not get? Like, they would e- only come out ahead. Could they not get equal value? <laughs> <laughs> did, they, did they want draft picks as well? <laughs> they uh, they had a London center, uh-huh. and so I went over in the spring of 1977 to London, and uh, and that was where I I got interested in in a, a whole different kind of music. Yeah, would you call that a landmark? time in your life so to speak and actually that there was i went to see john cale at the roundhouse and then i saw that ian hunter was going to be at um god it wasn't the rainbow although i did see iggy pop 
play at the Rainbow with uh, David Bowie on keyboards. So wow. that was pretty cool. Um, but then somewhere in there, Ian Hunter was going to be at the Hammersmith Odeon. Mm -hmm. And unbeknownst to me at the time, uh, uh, gosh, who, uh, who was Vibrators? Bo Bo no, Bowie's, oh. uh, Bowie's guitarist. Mick Ronson. Uh, Mick Ronson was, his, was uh, playing guitar for Ian Hunter. Which I didn't realize at the time, but the right. opening act was the Vibrators, okay. and you yeah. already know this story because I'm sure I've told you this you dozens right of ahead. times over the years. <clears throat> anyway, I was up in the balcony watching the the Vibrators, and it was this stupid punk band, and I thought, well, this this is going to be boring. I'll just sit through this, and then the band that I want to hear is coming out afterwards. And it was during the song "Baby Baby," mm. which, if you know the Vibrators, sure. is like a staple. Mm. It's like a ballad almost. Yeah. And it has this beautiful guitar solo about two thirds of the way into it. I just heard it, it the was, other day. It was during that guitar solo that I did a complete 180 on my my whole opinion of of music and and everything else. My whole outlook on life changed during dur baby during, baby during that guitar oh solo because I'd never heard anything so perfect in my life. Oh, wow, that's a really great story. Yeah, and, well, so you enjoyed the rest even, of their set. Even <laughs> even better uh, after the show I was went down in the subway and I saw a guy down there who'd been at the show and his name's Ian Galpin and mm -hmm. uh, Ian had recorded the show and so I got to talking to him and uh uh, he gave me a recording of that vibrator show that I'd just seen. So I actually have a recording of the very guitar solo that, that turned me around. So you, you have a recording of the light bulb going off on it, top of your it head. Pretty much, yeah. And you know, it, it, uh, my friend Jim Lees had introduced me to the Ramones the year before when right. the first album came out. And I, I kind of didn't get it. It, would, it just seemed like it was just power, thrashing guitar and everything was fast and... and I, I didn't quite understand it until I went to England and I was actually in the audience for right. it. And then it, it just, it just uh, um, changed, it literally, literally changed my life. Now, who did you see after that? I assume you probably sought out some, some punk bands to go check well, out it took, it took me a while to digest what I, what I had seen because mm -hmm. that was, it was such a paradigm for me. But yeah, I mean, I, pretty, I stayed over the summer. I was a night porter at the Piccadilly Hotel. Um, and I worked 12 hours a night, five nights a week. But the two nights that I wasn't a night porter, mm -hmm. I would try to seek out bands that were playing at the, the Marquee Club or, or wherever. Right. And so I always tried to spend at least one of those nights doing something interesting. So that was when I had a chance to really see firsthand a lot of these original punk, original punk bands in their so you say you work nights. So was it, was it during the day when you were busy getting kicked off of Paul McCartney's porch? That was actually when I was at school. <laughs> I wasn't on his porch. I was sitting across the street. I, uh, you said a, you were eating a sandwich a, or something? Yeah, a friend of mine. I was reading a Jane Austen book. And um, uh, I, a friend of mine who'd been to the London Center a, a couple of years before uh -huh. actually gave me uh, Paul McCartney's ad home address in, in St. John's Woods. So I went, went to his home, I found the house, and I, I was sitting across the street waiting for him to either come or go, or I could, I could be an adoring fan, which I'm sure he was plenty used to. Right. And so I'm sitting over there reading, and I hear this window open, and I look over at McCartney's house, and he's leaning out the window, and he says, excuse me, but do you need to be over there right now? And I said, oh, I, just, I came from America to say hi, and I waved at him, and he, he waved back, he said, Hi, the neighbors really don't like it when people, I guess I could do it like this. You know, the neighbors don't really like it when, when people hang out across the street. So if you could, if you could move along, that'd be great. So, I, so I, I, I moved along and thought, I wonder if this is a story that I'll ever tell anyone. Yeah, it is. It is. So, now, yeah, I, I had my FaceTime with, with Paul McCartney. Right. Now, I'm going to guess, Mike, in your case... That your bridge to punk was similar to like mine and perhaps Paul Mayhern's, and that would be Kiss. Yeah, isn't that weird? I know nobody believes it, but mm -hmm. but you know they were fairly raw and fairly simple yep. and, and fairly rock in there at the beginning, and they didn't sound smooth and silky like everybody else. And so you know, I mean, they weren't punk. I I mm -hmm. agree with that, but they were a springboard that many of us. Mm -hmm. So go ahead. Yeah, when, well, when I was in high school, there was, you know, not tons of people that were in music, but you could easily tell the ones that were into cool music, and they all had Bowie haircuts. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the people that I kind of hung out with. And the other people that were into music, they were into cover bands, which even back then I had no desire for. So I hung out with the 
the Bowie people who also probably had a very similar tie to the to the Kiss thing. You know, maybe the the glam and the and the so forth. But yeah, it's like it was very. It's it's a weird bridge, but it it. You look at all the people that list Kiss as an influence. Yeah. And I'm I sure mean, you throw in like Monster mm-hmm. Hoople or, mm-hmm. or Slade or uh, Sweet. Mm-hmm. Or, uh, Roxy Music. Roxy Music. Yeah, Martha Hoople. None of that stuff was for me until much later. It was really, really yeah, I know, isn't that weird? Just uh, maybe a little bit of Martha Hoople, but mm-hmm. uh, it was the, the Kiss. Kiss was definitely the... Yeah, yeah. for me, it was... It yeah, was the gateway <clears throat> drug. It was. It was well... <laughs> Well, you know, I had an uncle who was giving me lots of weird albums as a kid. Some of them I, I digested and some of them I did not. Uh, Lothar and the Hand People, I think, went right over my head. <laughs> right, ne- right, right next to Fever Tree. and uh, Trout Mask Replica? No, mm-hmm. now see, Trout Mask Replica have something different. Because I remember going through my uncle's records, just sitting on the floor, because he had so many. I was just fascinated that that, that 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 many albums actually existed, much less that anybody had that many. So I was flipping through them, and I didn't know any of them. And then poof, there's that trout mask replica, and it scared the shit but out the, of me. the cover. Yes, yeah, I was just like, Ugh, I don't ever want to see that again. Boom, <laughs> you know. And then you know, and then there, then years later, you know, people go, oh, "That's the album you got to hear. The album you got to hear." And I'm. It's the album's cover still kind of disturbs me. It's kind of, a, if you look at it, it's kind of, you think about how that, that head must have smelled. You know, you go, okay, now stick your face in this fish head for a while, you know. Okay. You know, and it just, yeah, I, I hated hey, that album. He was an artist. And actually, that wasn't the first Captain Beefheart album that I really liked. The first one I really liked was Doc at the Radar Station. So I love that album. And then I kind of went from there, you know, backwards Hot and forwards. Head. Yeah. So, okay, so now the first time... How did you meet Dave? Second time around. Second time around. Okay, that's how I so, met. That's how I met Dave. But yeah, but, specifically but, Devo yeah. pants. Now, mine was a little bit earlier. <laughs> yeah. Um, living on the east side, needless to say, didn't get out of that little place very much. Right. And for some reason, and I think it might have been because someone had said I'd already started getting into to punk that there was a record store in. In Broderpool, and it would have been where, where Gary Fryer worked. Record, a record company. A record company. Yeah. That they had got in the Sex Pistols album. That's, so, where, that's where I got it. Yeah. yeah. So I'm driving up there, and I'm driving down Broderpool Avenue, and I see in the corner window this giant damned poster. Hmm. I wonder where they got that. <laughs> and needless to say, there was probably... Cl- Something close to a wreck because I about died seeing a damned poster and pulled over and went in to second time around and Bob was there and I just you know I was probably blathering damn poster blah 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 and he said oh there's the punk records <laughs> <laughs> yeah because he was probably watching, watching an basketball. I, a basketball at the time yeah he, he didn't want to be or bothered files that yeah. was another another yeah. staple yeah. and so I'm going through the records and about ready to die and he says hey you know there's a band that practices here you ought to come by sometime I said oh you're kidding he said yeah just come by and knock at the back door and I came up there some night and just knocked on the back door, and the Joint Chiefs were practicing in the back room. So you met Dave as a band member rather yes. than a clerk. Yeah, no, I'd not met him until I oh. until I walked in the back door and, I see. and couldn't believe there was a band here. So and you met United. Dave in the back door. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. 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 All right, I want to go back to the second time around. Now why are you changing the subject? <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 real quick, I I was also buying record punk records the second time around, but it was back when they were. On, on Westfield Boulevard. On Westfield Boulevard next to the lawnmower repair shop. Right. Okay. And I went in there for a while, but that guy. Okay, I know you Was his name Chris? I, I listened to the, the podcast. So the, it was his name Chris, Chris? Hilt. He was mean to He's me. Actually, Chris is actually a friend of mine on Facebook. Well, he was mean to me to the point where I stopped going there. Chris okay. and... Uh, I started mailing for stuff. Chris and Bob were partners. I know. And didn't Bob buy him out because he was pissing off customers? I don't know about that. I mean, I it could be. When I got back from England, I had all these posters just that I didn't know what to do with. I didn't have room in my bedroom mm-hmm. um, to do anything with them. So I uh, I went by a second time around. I said, I will loan you these posters to put on your walls here for the cool factor if you'll give me a discount on any records I buy. And Chris was the guy behind the counter, and Chris just jumped at the chance. Uh-huh. And he said, yeah, that sounds great. And so Chris was actually the one who was nice to me 
oddly enough, and Bob was the one who sure. was kind of surly to me. Well, Bob was always kind of surly, but not in a mean way. No, no. He just, just, he just, that's just sort of the, his general outlook was just kind of gruff, but so not when, in a mean way. So when, when Bob bought Chris out, uh-huh. um, Bob asked me if I would like to basically kind of take Chris's place working it second time around. And I, I said, heck yeah. So it was a very part-time kind of thing when I started. I was also working yeah, Peaches, right? at Peaches, right? part-time at Peaches right. Records, yeah, which was like night and day. Because, I mean, they were playing, you know, uh, meatloaf over and they have, the the owner or the uh, manager of the store was so excited about the new meatloaf album that it was like on this cut that and uh, War of the Worlds do you remember that yeah that two record set uh-huh. I, I love that record for about a year <laughs> well you might have bought it at Peaches because they liked it a lot too yeah. uh, and do you remember Jim Ame by any sure. chance sure Jim Ame, that's where I met Jim Ame right and you guys built the, the crates for Blue Easter Cold to stand on <laughs> I don't remember that. You, you told me something like that, that, that when they came, they were so short that they couldn't uh, reach the over the counter to sign stuff, and you guys had to build crates for them to stand on. My, that could have been. Yeah. <laughs> if I said it, I believe it. And I almost not left that shop because Devo was playing down at Devo uh-huh. was at uh, Bogart's in Cincinnati, and uh, they were not going to let me off at Peaches for me to go see Bogart. It was Halloween night, 1978. Right. And there was no way I was missing that show, so I just said, you know what, I'm going. If you want to fire me, that's fine. So I ended up going. I came back. I had the job. The, I still had my job the next day. But so Sometimes but you've got to stand firm. That, that Devo show was, was right. again, just a wonderful show. Now, that's where you got the paint. You drew the right? line in the sand. I, a, yes, a red line. <laughs> a red line. That was my red line. And that's where you got the pants, right? Right, yeah. Okay. They, at some point, they threw it out in the audience. The yellow hazmat suit pants. Right. Now, what I remember, see, when I, when I started going back the second time around, I was doing something, and I still went to the record company. I bought most of my stuff for the record mm-hmm. company, but or, I, or I do Bob mail order. Yeah, with, with, with Dirty Mike. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and so <clears throat> I remember I was in Broad Ripple doing something, and I saw that Dan poster through the window too. But then I also saw the Devo pants, and I was like, "Devo pants? Where would somebody get <laughs> Devo pants?" And then you were working that day, and you're like, "Oh yeah, they threw them out into the audience when we were there." I was like, "You saw Devo?" <laughs> you know, because up to this point, I, look, I was still in high school when I when I met you. I was still a senior in high school. And it hadn't occurred to me that you could drive out of state to see a band that you wanted to see. That was a foreign well, concept to me. You sure weren't going to see them point. here. Well, that was the thing. Is I always just kind of thought at that time, I was like, well, I guess I'll never get to see anybody because nobody ever comes here. And when you said, oh, yeah, I saw Devo last week or whatever. And I said, where? And he was Cincinnati. And I was it like, opened the floodgates, didn't it? It did. It was like, Cincinnati, you can go to Cincinnati. And then, <laughs> and, then we, and then right around then... I think you had told me that you had tickets to the Clash, or the Clash were coming. Uh, they they, they to went the to uh, in uh, Cleveland. The first time I saw the oh, Clash. Oh, you saw them in Cleveland. Yeah, I had to drive up to Cleveland to see the Clash the first time. So that and, was before and the one. And Bo in Chicago. Diddley opened up for them. Well, he also opened up for them in Chicago. I don't, I, that could be undertones. Bo Diddley and the Clash. That was the Aragon. I was there. Aragon, right? Mm-hmm. So, and I remember you guys saying because because you were either there. Or I had seen you on one of my other visits there, and you guys had said you were planning on going to see the Clash of the Aragon, and I said I want to do that too. And you guys were, you know, fairly welcoming. Like, you know, we'll let this guy. Come. Yeah, you were just a skinny guy. You, was, you fit in the back seat without any problem. Yeah, and uh, you probably don't remember this, but after we got tickets, we found out that the Buzzcocks and the Gang of Four were actually playing in Chicago like a week or two before that. So the Clash would have been my first out-of-town concert had it not been for that Buzzcocks Gang of Four show at, now, wasn't it a pizza place? It was, wasn't it? It was like Mother, it was either Mother's or Mother Bear's. Mother's sounds right. Does it? Now, what, was Mother Bear's a pizza place? Wasn't it like down in the basement or something? Yes, it was a dingy, nasty, dank basement. Yeah, which was always the best place to see yeah. any of those punk bands. Yeah, and I, if I remember correctly, we were all more impressed with the Gang of Four than we were with the Absolutely. Buzzcocks. Yeah, I, was, I think we were all disappointed that the Buzzcocks weren't better than they were. Right. I think we might have caught on a tired night or something, because I saw them later on, and they were great. You know, I mean, uh, like, right before they broke up, and then a couple of the reunion shows, and they were they were great. But I, but I remember that night, I don't, I don't know if it was maybe because they were bad, or because the Gang of Four were just so good and so different. Because they, they were different. I think it was a little bit of both. Because, I mean, I had never seen anything like that. Right. And, I mean, and, and, it wasn't just the way he was playing, but the funny faces and the 
turkey moves they were making kind of kind of sold it as the, way, a whole. the way they'd kind of lurch across the stage yes yeah like they were lurking like lurkers would do <laughs> yes not not to be confused with the band the lurkers i would never i would never i first met mike in sort of a different way actually i can't even say i met him because i don't think i actually talked to him i just found out it was him later he was with he was with the one who shall not be named at the Hyatt Regency. Do you remember this? You know what oh, I'm I going? remember it. I know. It, yeah. it, 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 makes, me, it makes me very sad because I remember it, it in, yeah. What? Because you remember back then that if you liked a band or you liked punk or whatever, and you needed to try to find other people in town that did, because there weren't that many of them, you had to send out the signals. So you'd have your buttons, you know. Right, your, your jam. Stranglers, oh, yeah. your button, whatever. your stranglers, the jam, Susie, whatever. You'd have your, you know, and a lot of people had like a ton of buttons oh, on yeah. their coat. Like they were really throwing out a lot of fishing lights, <laughs> <laughs> fishing nets to catch anybody, something. Anybody, please. So anyway, Blue Oyster Cult were playing the convention center. Up until that point, I used to borrow the 35-millimeter camera that the, the school had when I used to take pictures of concerts. Well, my grandfather bought me a 35 millimeter camera, but he was in Brown County and he couldn't get it to me in time for the show. And he bribed my uncle, Jim, not my, not Kevin, but my other uncle, he bribed him to take this camera down to me all the way from Brown County to the Hyatt Regency. So he shows up, he's got a bag, it's got a brand new a Pentax camera in it, you know, and all this, all this stuff. And I'm going, ripping into the box, sitting at the couch, just huge semicircular couch in Hyatt Regency. Mm-hmm. And me, and, in the me lobby. and Phil... Yeah, me and Phil, or, or to the folks who look at the website, John, were way on one end of the couch, and him and he were on the other side. He, he who cannot be mentioned? He who will not be you know, mentioned. I have to say this will story, be on the other side as a of listener, the couch. It, it loses a little emphasis. Is it important who he who cannot be mentioned is? I have a running thing where I'm just not going to say his name. It's like the or gold, talk to him. It's like the Goldmans will not mention O.J. Simpson. He yeah, is, kind he's of. the killer. Yeah. So, but anyway, so I got this camera, and I'm about as happy as I've ever been because I'd always wanted a camera, and it was a nice camera. It was the one I had, you know, forever. And and I'm I'm putting this thing together. I'm thinking, oh boy, I'm going to take some great pictures of one of my favorite bands. I love Blue Oyster Cult fan. And what was even better is we had already seen them. They had gone out to do their sound check, and we didn't know they were staying at the Hyatt. You know, we were just kids. We you know. You know, they were like, oh, there they go. And they were, you know, Buck Darm had his white suit on and stuff. You know, they're just walking out. And so we're like, oh. So I get my camera and I'm just like so happy. I'm so happy. And there's this guy at the other end of the couch going, oh, I like the Stranglers. How about you? You like the Stranglers too? Oh, 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 oh. And just like just blowing us all sorts of shit from a pretty far away distance on this couch. We weren't even sure he was making fun of us at first. Okay, and then finally I realized that he was saying stuff because of some of the buttons I must have had on. Like I said, I didn't know but it was Mike who was sitting there next to him. And then when I saw Mike later at the store, I was I thought he looked familiar, and I was like, "Were you with?" It? And he, in all fairness, I don't remember you being mean. <laughs> so oh, I wasn't. I was embarrassed at the whole well, thing. We, because... we, all, we all know with things that have happened since then that he can be the instigator of embarrassing situations. I think I know who you're talking about. Yes. And in in his defense, it's he's just that way. I you know. know, there was nothing but no, it was it was embarrassing. I remember sitting there going, you know, <laughs> Why? <laughs> I, mean, I was just a high school kid, and, and and admittedly, you guys were a couple years older, so maybe I was kind of annoying or irritating. Or, or look, I'm amazed to this day that the Gizmos put up with me. If Bob didn't want to fuck me so bad, I don't think I would have been in that van. When is his podcast coming out? Oh, I can't wait. Yeah, are you kidding? <laughs> I, I I was hoping to get maybe him and maybe a couple of the original Gizmos, maybe Ted and yeah, and, uh, maybe together to to spin some yarns and. Uh, Tell some oh, tales this, of the, the stories that could debauchery. Be told. Yes, yeah. I want to yeah. hear more about Hoboken. Hoboken, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, but all 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 funniness aside, uh, Bob was always really nice to me. I mean, he never he never was you know he never tried anything unsavory or or was anything more than polite to me. You know, he didn't give me any better discount on records than he gave anybody else. It wasn't, it wasn't like uh, Brian Epstein and John Lennon? No. No, and that weekend would never exist. 
No, it just wouldn't happen. You know, and the thing, well, you know, look, I was probably the asshole at some point because I was trying to get him interested in someone else so he'd forget about me. I was like, well, well, what about Phil? He might be gay. Why don't you ask him? <laughs> I was like, so, uh, you know, it, was, it wasn't. It wasn't anything more than me probably just being kind of embarrassed by the whole thing. But I still wanted to be, you know, with the cool rock and roll dudes. And so I had to kind of, you know, juggle whatever embarrassment I had going on with my, with my desire to be cool. So and that's that, how you met Mike, was down at the Hyatt? Yes. Before a Blue Oyster cool. Cult show. Uh-huh. And that was so funny because I wanted, I had never seen the gizmos and I just kept reading them about them. And I wanted to go. I was kind of like you. It's like, I can leave Indianapolis and go <laughs> Go, go, go see the gizmos because it's like this is really early in their career you know i still found a way to read about them i have no idea Roxy. how that yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yep now uh, we're still kind of the early days as far as indiana was concerned i mean other than the three of us i honestly didn't know virtually anybody else who liked the same music at at that time people finding people like that were few and far between but i think probably the first time the the Ramones played here probably opened the doors a little bit, wouldn't you say? I'm talking about the first time they played mm-hmm. the vote. Mm-hmm. Right? Sure. Now, is that the one that you recorded, or was it the second time? No, he recorded the second The second time. The second, right? second, but you yeah. were there at the first show, right? I'm not sure. I have were a great story. Oh, God, I have a greatest story in the world right. about that first show. So it's like, you mean the Ramones are coming to <laughs> Indianapolis? It's like, I can't even tell you what... Parts of my body were tingling at what rate? Well, let me pause just for one second to uh-huh. let you know that at that time I was only fourteen or fifteen years old. Oh, and so I knew they were going to be there, and I was almost to the verge of tears. I mean, I would have tried anything. I to did. Get in. I wasn't of age. No, I wasn't okay, of go age. Go ahead. And uh, the person that I was with and I went early, 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 like like at noon. <laughs> and when they started loading equipment in and at some point someone wasn't looking and we went in the back door and they still had the back door again yeah i know twice and we're not back door plays into this story quite a bit he's a back door man and we're not even an hour into this come on i know but anyway we snuck in and being an old movie theater they still had the giant thick red velvet curtains you know on both sides and so we hid inside those curtains for hours hours <laughs> until they officially opened the doors right. and the minute they did we just kind of crossed our fingers and thought oh please no one see us and we ran out and we sat in the very front row of tables there was a bit of a space that yeah, was, they used to have tables at the front didn't they yeah but not as far there there was a dance floor per se it was probably Let's just say. I mean, there's 20, twenty. There's that big bar near the front. Now. None of that stuff. None was, of that was. There. None of that stuff was there. I think there was be- the stage. There was a dance floor, and then it's a railing, and then that's when the tables started. Right. <clears throat> so we got the first table. If you were looking at the stage on the left hand side, and uh, just the whole time we're just praying that someone was going to come and. Grab and tap us, you on the shoulder. Grab us by the nap of the Excuse neck me, and, and, and yank us out of there. Because it's like, oh my god, please! And so you can just imagine this was probably even an hour before the first band even right. played, and we're still just sitting here terrified. <laughs> and so it, it became obvious, like whew, we made it. And the opening band was the Screams out of Chicago, right. who I also really liked. And they were uh, they had probably started playing. And we were sitting there, and someone sat, at, it was a table for four, and someone sat at our table, and it's like, well, not that that's any big deal, you know, we don't have to be table hogs. Turned around, it was Patty Smith. Who had played that night, right? Who had played that night, which here I am in Indianapolis and going, I can't believe the Ramones are here, but Patty Smith is playing the same night. Right. Um, she opened for Bebop Deluxe. No, it was the other way around. Okay. It was other and also the Gizmos played that night too, so none of the Gizmos could go to the Ramon show either. Oh god. Of all of all the nights, of all of the all nights in the world, Bob booked them on that <laughs> night. And I couldn't go see any of those three shows. Oh jeez. Uh, there were three to choose from. I couldn't go to any of them. 
Oh. My dad was like mad at me or something at that <laughs> oh. point, and something happened. I forget what it was. Oh, jeez. Yeah, didn't go to any of them. So at least, you know, I, I unfortunately didn't get to see Patti Smith, but she sat at our table <laughs> for several songs, and then she got up, and she really liked the screams, and she danced uh, for several of their songs until they were done, and then I assume she went back and hung with the Ramones for right. the rest of the night. Do you remember about yeah. month and year that that was? The first time the Ramones played the Vogue? Well, if I said 78... No, because <laughs> 78 was when they played the Vogue the second, and Bloomington. And I saw oh, them okay, well, yeah. at the Bloomington show. Yeah, I saw them there, too. So it had to be, what, God, 76, 77 then? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so now after that Ramon show, uh, I seem to remember starting to see maybe a few more a few more leather jackets in town, a few more buttons, a few more t-shirts. Right. And I think shortly after that was the first time I met, I met Marvin. Well, let me ask you something, though. Okay. The, the, to me, and I was at Ball State until May of 78. Okay. But the first show that I remember that. in Indianapolis was Elvis Costello, Mank DeVille, and Rock Pile at the Circle Theater. Right. Now that, well, that show... Now, what I, year, I mean... I, I think that, that was May, I don't know roughly to, May of 78. I don't no, know if we have to keep things I think I think that might have been 77. Or if it's 78, it would have been really I was about to graduate from Ball State. Do you remember, do you remember how much that show cost? $1.95. Buck, buck $1.95. It was, a, it was a low-do show. A low-do show. And Q95 sponsored it for reasons I will never understand. Well, I'm sure there was some payola involved in there somewhere. Well, or, or it was one of those things where you can have Linda Ronstadt if you let, exactly. if you get Elvis Costello in there somewhere, right? Because the thing, when I I was in New York for a couple of weeks, uh, and and when I came back, my friends were supposed to have bought Aerosmith tickets for us, and when I came back, they said, hey, "We got some bad news. Aerosmith is sold out. We can't go." And at that point, I didn't care because I had that whole punk. My light bulb went off when I was in New York, and I just, like, didn't give a shit about Aerosmith when I came back. And he goes, oh, but the good news is Elvis Costello and Nick Lowe's playing at blah, blah, blah. It's only a buck ninety-five. So I took pictures at that show. Eric took some 8 millimeter footage at that show. I but pictures I don't from remember, that show. Yeah, I don't remember there being that many people there, maybe a couple hundred, maybe. Well, what I'd like to, I'd love to see a, a, a picture of the audience, because my guess is that you would know look all at, of them. you'd look at that picture and you'd go, oh my God, I can't believe all but these see, people I, were I there. remember it being like, wow, I can't believe there was that many people here, but maybe. Well, I don't think it was quantity, but I just think, yeah. what was the movie that came out a few years ago? Was it 24 Hour People? 24 Hour Party People. P- party People. Where, where, where they have this... Uh, uh, sex Pistol show. Yeah, the, the famous se- Sex Pistol show. Right, and then they show the audience, and, and this guy, Howard DeVoto, is in the audience, and, and all these people yeah. in, in the movie, you know. Are, are, and so it turned out that that show was kind of a, a, a ground zero right. for, for much of what happened in, in punk in England in the next year or so. Mm. Which, I guess, brings us to the uh, Suburban Gorilla Pop Festival. Yeah, sure. It takes us right there. Boom! <laughs> All right, so Tony, what was the Suburban Gorilla Pop Festival? Actually, wait a minute, stop. I, we we got to go. After I met you, I didn't know you played in a band until you said, I think maybe what happened, I had to use the bathroom or something. And uh, and I say, hey, can I use the bathroom? You're like, oh, it's down by, by the back door there. And I went through and there was all those instruments set up. Mm-hmm. Right. And I had only ever once been in a room with instruments before, and that was at, at an MX-80 sound rehearsal that my uncle took me to. Other than that, I had never been in the same room with, like, drums, bass, all the setup and everything. I came out and said, what's, what's going on back here? Oh, that's my band, blah, blah, blah. And I well, started coming it was, it was to... the Joint Chiefs of the Staff. The Joint Chiefs of Staff, right. And, and I used to come to practices as well. You guys used to let me come to practices. Heck yeah. Around. And I'm probably, that's probably how we got to yeah, be each other. because I was doing sound. Yeah, we both come in that back door and watch the Joint Chiefs of Staff. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Mike was the best the third sound time man in, ever. Third time, back door. Buckhorn and Funyuns <laughs> abounding. And, uh, <sighs> right. And Buck Mike, Mike had his appearance doing Rock Lobster. Mm-hmm. Yep, buckhorn okay. beer and rock lobster. Well, one way, and then it's, I remember it's kind of like a clam bake. <laughs> yeah, but, but then I remember you saying, "Hey, we're playing live," and I said, "Where? Where? I want to go." And it was at the Suburban Gorilla Pop Festival that right. Bill Levin was putting on. Right now, this was one of his first shows. Right, he was promoter at Third Base, but I think this was. Maybe even before third well, base. This was before. This, this was definitely before. This was third definitely base. Yeah, because the third Jesus base. from France did not definitely exist, before. exist at this yeah. point. And and I and I, I I contend that it was the suburban gorilla pop festival in Indianapolis that Bill Levin promoted. 
it was the epicenter of uh, the full blown punk movement in this town. Mm -hmm. I, if I you, agree. If oh, you yeah. look at everyone who played at that, I mean, it was the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Latex Novelties, Eddie and the Otters. Um, I can't your remember. parents, perhaps? Yeah, I think your parents. Your parents, yeah. And there were a couple of other bands that are on that flyer. All of which, if you sort of start thinking like the, like the family tree thing, that, that people branched out from any of those bands and, and went on to do something pretty interesting. I just remember the wet t-shirt contest. And free beer. Was there free beer, really? Yeah, that, that, that's how Bill got people to show up, was he, he promoted free beer. <laughs> I don't put it past him. Uh, <laughs> uh, wow. No, I just remember, you know, because we went to see you guys, but when we found out there was a wet t-shirt contest, I mean, that was the first one of those for me, too. And I'm like going, really? They're you know, going to do that? You just can't beat a good wet t-shirt kind not after a day of hot sweaty punk rock mm -hmm. it was a real was it was the icing to the cake mm -hmm. you know but yeah after that it was it was you're right because it was after that that i started thinking you know i'd kind of like to be you know in a band you know it, it, it would be fun it looks like the girls pay attention blah, blah 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 and uh you know and i had been playing drums a little bit over at phil's house he had a set in his garage and we'd go over there and we'd play like surf music you know or whatever and then I and then I was thinking that you know Mike wasn't in a band, and neither was Mike Woods. And I thought, well, hey, you know, there there we go right there. There's there's a power trio for the for the ages, <laughs> you know. And we knew we knew we could rock the socks off anybody in town and, without and even, without even practicing. And was there a band um, that developed from that? Well, there was. And you know, the funny thing was, we we became the cheeses from France. Do you remember why, though? Because I this all just came back to me just a couple of days Save ago. Say for homage. You because remember? didn't you you were working somewhere? I was working as a pantry chef right. at the glass chimney, yeah. which was the, <clears throat> the most hoity-toity place in town yeah. where you could eat. And the chef got this huge you, box yep. of promotional materials, buttons, and by all the kinds Jesus of stuff. from France. <laughs> it was the Jesus from France Corporation I or don't something. Think I ever heard that. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, there was posters. There was a bag of buttons. There hmm. was stickers. There was and all of it said, "Yeah, it's an instant." Say for homage, Jesus from France. It was an instant <laughs> promo kit for us. Yes, and we were thinking, man, we've got all this promotional material. We don't have to pay for it. Is that we, yeah, we had flyer material. We had we gave away those cheeses from France buttons, and the name just kind of created itself. It did really. And, People um, still come out of the word woodwork and tell me they still have their cheeses from France button. Mm -hmm. Well, we so, made, remember we made T-shirts. Oh yeah, oh, I, yes. don't, I don't. You know, of all the T-shirts I made and all the bands I was in, I don't have any of them. Well, I had my cheeses. From I always France gave out the last one to somebody. You know. I had my cheese from France shirt. And yeah. Yellow and it was black and it had different cheese. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that so when you recorded us doing Heart of Gold, that must have been like the crowning achievement of your producing it was. career you at know, that point, right? After that my life just went downhill because I could never quite equal the excellence and creativity can, of that recording. Can we step in just real quick in the back a second time around, as well, as well as all the instruments, we had a four-track recorder. Right. That, was, and, that was a little bit later. But, but, we were, but once we had it, we recorded just... Well, we, I think Diddy Wah Diddy was the crowning achievement we, for that we, technology. We were, that was just great because we had the ability to record you sure. know, whenever we wanted to. So. Well, you know, like I was telling Paul... You know, I never saw the Zero Boys until Germany in the 1990s. And it wasn't because I was snobby or didn't want to see anybody or whatever, but we had a back room all to ourselves with musical instruments, recording equipment, beer, weed, and, and people would just stop by and see us. We didn't have to go visit anybody. I mean, we literally had like this little kingdom back there that we sort of oversaw. Why would we go anywhere else? I mean... We were there five nights a week. Oh, five yeah. nights well, a and week. Is we this when looking. it was on the corner? Yeah, it was on the corner. This, and this was this was kind of after the Joint Chiefs and all that stuff had had uh, had dissipated, and you had gone on to do uh, you know your your uh, corporate gig. Can I call it that? Sure. And I don't mean it any defamatory way. I had a real job, right? Um, Exactly. You, okay. you became an upright citizen while the rest well, of us decided to swim around in the bottom of the sewer for a I, little while. I remember longer. when second time around moved mid to the mid block. Yeah, we, we block. didn't have we didn't have practice space. No. See, I, I've often wondered if it wasn't those late night rehearsals that that made. Remember Charlie Bardock uh -huh. owned that whole block of yeah. buildings right there. That Charlie heard so many complaints about our practicing back there and you guys practicing back there mm. that that was one of the reasons that. Second time around, lost that. Lead. But see, but when we were practicing, there were no. And no, when we were no, practicing, wouldn't say it to yeah, you. Yeah, but when we were practicing, there was nothing else but, around to disturb. Well, yeah, there was there was um, a Union Jack. 
And I, I have heard, I'd heard that in Union Jack they could hear us practicing. Hmm. And I would guess that they better were, than what and they could really hear us after I got those yeah, seven I, drums. I have a feeling that they uh, better they, than what have, they were playing over their system. No, they'd have no, a short no, fuse no, for that. Yeah, mm. and we were using them for free tacos for a while. <laughs> it's happy hour. I'll be right back. Okay, go get you a plate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but no, I mean, I mean, you know, we had this whole room that basically had everything in it that we needed. Hell, you know, look, I was back there on the weekends too, but that's because there was a bed back there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think I remember going in the front door you once. You walked in on us once, yes. It was so funny, too, because the lights were off, and it was just the sound of the front door opening, and this person next to me, again, who will go unnamed for sensitive reasons, just freaked out like a wild animal caught like between, like, you know, three traps or something. Well, it was a very distinctive like, sound, that the key going in the door. Yeah, yeah she's, and, the, and the lock and the door opening. And, and then the, she, I mean, and, and look, even if you wanted to come back and see what was going on, which, trust me, you didn't, but, uh, well, I, I don't uh, even I, if you did, it would have taken you a good 10 to 15 seconds to walk back all the way there. She was acting like you were already standing over the bed or something. It was like, ah! And then and I, I got bitched at about that, and... Shortly after, I think that Bill of grab, grabbed her boobs at one of our shows. You remember that? <laughs> yeah. Well. Okay. Okay. So anyway, so the Joint Chiefs of Staff, you guys are playing out live, and then there's uh, there's that show at third base. That I think also was kind of an important show. Now, wasn't it? it was Dow Jones right? Because there, that was it was the night they were videotaped. The Mike story. actually has a really good history the retarded of, gods. Of, of third base and the no wave dance parties right. as it relates to twenty one forty seven. Mm. Just we we were practicing in in uh, the back of second time around. Okay, and I assume yeah, it was the Joint Chiefs, and there's this knock at the door, and these this couple comes in and it, and they start talking to us about how cool the new wave scene is, and oh, you have a new wave band and a punk band or whatever, and. Mike, you remember this? Oh, yeah, yeah. distinctly. And, and it's like, we're going to start a club in Indianapolis, and it's going to be nothing but punk and new wave music. It's going to be this alternative wasn't used sure. at the time, but it was going to be out of the mainstream. And they have, this, they have this space down there right next to the Black Curtain Dinner Theater at 2147 North Talbot Street. And um, what was it? And, and they just wanted to know if, if we were like kind of on board with this idea. And we said, yeah, that'd be great. And, and tell me, is, is this right? No. That, that, yeah, and so, so they, so, but they don't know what to name it. Well, and, they didn't know anything. They just knew they wanted to do it. Yeah, I mean, they drove, they, they pulled mm. up in a Mercedes. I mean, they were, they were obviously not exactly the same demographic as who their audience would be. And so, uh, anyway, they came back a few days later. They, and so we were thinking about what to call it. And there was a guy named Dave the Pipe Smoker who would come in the second time around on Sundays with his wife. And what I remember was he was always smoking a pipe. And if they came up to, to the counter to talk to me, and I've never seen this before, they would talk at the same time. So I was never sure who I was listening to. Uh -huh. Have you ever had a couple that does that? Uh -huh. Not that I can remember. I, and I, I've never seen it since then, but they talked at the same time. But I remember kind of cornering Dave the, Dave the pipe smoker and asking him if he had any ideas for this, this club. And he said, well, well, you know, a lot of... A lot of places will will name their business after the street address, and so I was like, "Oh, well, that's okay." So it'd be twenty one forty seven. So they came back. This couple, what was a couple nights later, Brenda yeah, and couple, Mike. Brenda and Mike came back, and and uh, they said, "Wait, did you come up with a name for us?" And I said, "Well, uh, Dave the pipe smoker came in." And, <laughs> Uh, and so we, he suggested just calling it twenty one forty seven, and that was how that club got its name. And then, and we could go on about, I, I, you know, that had. Were you there for any of the opening nights? Because it was the Gizmos and Dow Jones. I was there. For they didn't know what to do the, the, about food. The, the, we made the menu. We did the pricing. We booked the bands. We did everything. Yeah, we mm -hmm. were kind of plugged into that. And mm -hmm. then the second weekend was, I think it was the Hoosier Daddies, and the Joint Chiefs. Does that sound right? Yeah. It does sound right. Yeah. And then after that, then they had a band come in from Ohio <laughs> that just everyone hated. It was just there was something about that band that just rubbed everyone wrong, and I think that was kind of the start of the end for that. Was that the Indianapolis punk scene had a very short fuse for shitty ass, <laughs> yeah. and so uh, so anyway, at some point we were supposed to, we were booked to be, to play down there, and Mike, <clears throat> re refresh my memory, what happened? Well, we were down there watching a show, and we opened up the weekly or monthly at the time, which would have been hot potato, perhaps. 
Hot potato, yeah, sounds <clears> about right. Yeah, looking f- for our name. Yeah, the Joint Chiefs of Was Radio Free Rock still going at that time? Yeah, possibly, but I'm pretty sure it was Hot Potato. Okay. And uh, so we're sitting in a booth, I remember it very distinctly, and looking at the 2147 ad, and then there's another band yeah, where yeah. we were supposed to be playing. Yeah, yeah. Went, they said, <clears throat> you'd, we, we're, we're going to put you in on the week of blah, blah, blah. And then that week came and went, and we weren't there. And so it was like, what, what happened? And well, well, we, we've moved you to this other weekend, which is going to be a better weekend. Mm-hmm. And it's going to be better anyway. So we... we you know, so then we look at that weekend. We're not in there, mm-hmm. and we're getting we're getting we were pissed. livid. We were, and we went back in the kitchen and just just cornered them, <laughs> and just they, of course they had it was just you know, blah, 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 and it's like we didn't want to hear it. So, so how did third base work into this? The third base worked into it because someone and gosh, I wish I could remember, but said, "Hey, there's this place downtown, and there's a restaurant downstairs, but there's nothing going on upstairs. They do." meetings or something you ought to call this guy up and we went down to a pay phone someone had given them must have been someone there at 2147 well, the that rest night. of that story is dirty mike had had a party yeah. down there yeah that must have been it and so, so, and yeah. I, so i ran into dirty mike over it over it in front of a record company i remember standing in the parking lot just saying hey how did you get booked into that spot because it was kind of a cool area it, it, it was like we were talking about this before. Third base was the coolest club. You went there. I agree. Yeah. It was like I it was like a the, bunch of times. It was like the cavern club, but it was upstairs instead of downstairs. It was long and narrow. It had this real grimy stage at one end. And then it had sort of the space at the other end where, where Danny, I think that was his name, could could sell beer. Right. And so the deal was whoever, if anyone who could bring in a crowd could get the door and, and then they and, kept the beer right. Danny got all the beer money. Right. And this is how I met Bill Vinn, because Bill Vinn was there as well. Oh, was, the was, first night Bill was, was there. Was that when he didn't have any with, pants on? With no pants on. Yeah, back when he was occasionally the crown prince of public nudity, yes. <laughs> yes. Back before he became <clears throat> the pontiff of pot. <laughs> um, but see, now here, here's, here's, here are my memories. The first time I went there, me and you were doing the door for you guys and somebody else, I forget who. And if you remember correctly, we were at the door, and there was a fair amount of people coming through the door, oh. a line of 10 or 20 people, and I'm like going, oh, $2, $2, $2, $2, you know, and I'm getting tired of saying the same thing over and over again, and so I start improvising, and then I go, uh, $2, that's 50 cents per limb. <laughs> Do you remember this? Oh, yeah. And it was Randy King. <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't know. No one knew. You knew because you went. Like, oh well. You went like no, like that, no. and then you like walked away from the table. What I meant was it wasn't a well-known right. fact. I didn't know. I was just making a joke, you know. <laughs> and, and he didn't say anything, so I, I, I guess it was no biggie. I've never talked to him about it since then. So, mm. Randy, if you happen to listen to mm. this, uh, no hard mm. feelings. <laughs> we were not happy with. With Steve, right? <clears throat> yeah, that was that was either and brewing no, or had no, brewing. it it had just happened, and it might have happened that night that we found out we were playing, uh, and it was kind of like we were just in a bad mood. Well, it just the whole thing because I think that that we might have been telling Steve that we weren't happy with whatever. I don't think we said hey. Or you would have said I wasn't in the band at the time, but just I know just a lot of things not happy about Steve, and I think that wait a second that'd be L four four D, not to not the Joint Chiefs. Can I just pause just real real quick here? So we're talking about the Joint Chiefs of Staff. The Joint Chiefs of Staff broke up or metamorphosized yeah, no, into no, 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 yeah, no, no. That's what that's what I, that's what I meant. The Joint the Joint Chiefs. So we, we Gary Gary Fryer left, right, and Mark Gaines left. Right. Okay. Right. So, at that, all at that exact same time, we were being douched on by the twenty bamboozled by twenty one forty seven. So we booked the show, and whether it was right before or right after the 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 change, and then I was designated bass player, and I had like about a month to (laughs) learn an instrument that I never played before. You did a fine job. Yeah. Uh, Marvin told me I was better than Mark. At what? Mark made it look hard. That was my big criticism. Everyone said that about Mark, that 
He could play the bass, but he made it look really hard to play the bass. He always looked like he was concentrating with every bit that he had. It, and his yeah, eyes that, never That's what I mean, the Joint Chiefs to yeah, the, 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 the L4D. Right. So, so all that happened at the same time, and that was the first L4D show was at, okay. at, at one but of it the Noah Dance. it would have been Agent Orange, though, right? Yeah, but, but I just mean the... The person, right, the, and not to be confused with the 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 California exactly, group, which Agent is why Orange. you change your name, right? Because it's Joint Chiefs of Staff to Agent Orange, Agent Orange to last four digits, right. right? And Agent Orange and the last four four digits had the exact same lineup, we okay. just have a different name. Yeah, and actually, there's flyers probably for that No Wave Dance Party that say Agent Orange. I right. made those them, Color so. Xerox flyers. You remember the ones with the person standing in the shadowy door, and most of us, if you saw, was it, it was it that oh. kid, the kid in the doorway? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, no. And that was us. Those of them. It was us, the last four digits, the retarded gods, and Dow Jones. Correct? Well, that show would have been the one that was filmed. Right. It was. Yeah. It mm-hmm. was. Well, they didn't film us. I mean, they. I guess they didn't know how mighty Alexis cheese day. was going to be. This day makes it sound like there was a production truck that parked mm-hmm. outside well, and ran cables up into the into third base. If there it. was, they weren't in, interested in any cheese. But anyway, that was the metamorphosis from... From Joint Chiefs to what would later become well, the, and, and from twenty one forty seven to third base, yeah, from twenty one forty seven to third base, and so. then and then you guys recorded a lot of stuff as the last four digits, and then decided to wait thirty five years to put it out. Oh yeah. Yeah, 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 let it kind of let it age. Yeah, let we it, had to uh, wait for the public to catch up to us. See, no, we recorded as, you know all the time, but then we did um, Diddy Wah Diddy for. Red Snurds right. in honor because we had been friends with George Scott and he had died. Right. So that's why we did that. That was our recollection of how they played it. I'd never heard any of the other versions other than theirs yeah, at the time. Close. Yeah, because remember we had seen we had seen Eight Eyed Spy on one of our trips. To, no, hold to on, New York. hold on. Their version had a very prominent saxophone, and we yes. didn't have a saxophone. No. But you had a guy that made look playing the bass. But John, John had heard another version of it, and he kind of interpreted. Pre- There's a bunch. Of I know, but he had it. a different one. Who he's played for us, and it's like, yeah, that's pretty much how we're playing it. But um, well, that's what he said. I I tend to disagree. Yeah, I think I think ours has. Our, you, you'd actually be hard pressed to find anything that our version has in common with mm-hmm. other versions. No, our our version kicks ass. It's it's great. But um, yeah. So we recorded our single, put it out ourselves. But then we had all this other stuff that was recorded that had never had anything done to it mm-hmm. until now. Just sort of sitting sitting in the archives. So now, right around the time when this gets posted, you've got a new album and CD coming out there, right? It'll be coming out at the end of June. Yeah, he's been recording all this. Oh way. darn that one thing I said earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, most likely it'll, it'll be at the end of June, and it's a it's a uh, it's not only L four four D, but then when L four four D had a, a personnel shift, and mm-hmm. that was that was when Steve and Richard left, and then uh, Mr. Science and Julie joined us. Right, mm-hmm. this was around the time when you guys started palling around with Dow Jones and the Industrials, right? Actually, we had we had we had been palling around for a long time. Yeah, L four four D. Actually, even going back to the Joint Chiefs. Yeah, and, we played a show. Yeah, the the fascist first night. Mm-hmm. I think we, yeah we were on the list for that. Right. But uh, no, actually, because if you think about it, science left Dow to come join our band. Well, they broke up. I think they were going to break up whether he left them or not, didn't he? No, or, they didn't. No, break no, up. they continued on because their last show was that show that we played in Bloomington, the Cheeses for France. Their well, second show with, with, was with, Dow with, Jones' last show, and I and I believe said, with, it was the science? last. I believe it was the last show with, with Mr. Science with Science and because uh, they Chris were Clark. arguing like crazy backstage. Well, I mean, everybody Chris everybody Clark, could hear them. Chris arguing. Clark. And uh, science left and were replaced by two other people, and so Greg and Tim tried to keep Dow Jones going uh-huh. for for a little while longer. I see. Mm-hmm. Am I right? Yeah. What Jenny yeah. was Kenny, it? Jenny Sweeney. Jenny played keyboards, and I don't remember who else was brought in. So um, yeah, because I remember that that night in Bloomington was that was the last night I think he played with them because because before well, before we played yeah they they didn't like each other as far as I could tell that much anyway well when whenever one of the members of the band couldn't show up they played as the progressive fascist pig right. band so that was kind of like a trio that would normally have been Dow Jones and I think that 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 was getting on people's nerves was that there would be times when and I can't remember who it was that didn't show up mm-hmm. I don't mm-hmm. know if it was was it Brad or or Greg. I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, we had played with them long before, but when they finally, you know, Brad finally left, then he he came and did the L5D thing. So that was between our single that we had put out 
and we'd already booked a tour. The big picture EP. The big right. picture EP. And then we'd booked our own East Coast tour, but then personnel had changed, and then the version that played that tour was actually L5D. Right. Now, so. now were you were you playing with us as the Weezing Combo during this, or was it after? After. It was after. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. The time really just fly. Well, it? right after L4-5D, we had We're Jimmy Hoffa. Right. And then it was after that, then... But at, at some point after that, it was like you going, okay, I got to go build my life. I'll see you. Right, 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 right. Yeah. And then, and, and then, I had written a bunch of songs, and you had written a bunch of lyrics, and then we did. Yeah, because someone let <clears> the dog <throat> into the place <throat> where you use your phone. Yeah. 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 Something like that. Yeah. I remember. So I had all these yeah. songs, and you had all these lyrics, and that's what Weezing Combo was. Right. So. Now that was me and you, right? And Chris Cruzan and Eric, right? <laughs> rotating members brad smith would play every once in a while and remember uh he he played a bit louder than everyone else did a wee bit and then, and then he'd get mad if we didn't like it loud and yeah but it was basically eric you me and chris yeah there was a revolving back door on that one but there's another back door my god because well, i seem to remember some guy that we called dan with the mellow hair door. dan with the mellow hair who was who played bass for a while was and he had like a stand-up bass like, mm-hmm. like, boom, 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 and I remember also Bob, Bob, uh, Bob the punk guy. Um, Did Bob Schick play with us for a little bit? He, really? Remember we we mic we mic'd up those little octobons that I had. Mm-hmm. Remember those little square drums with the mallets? We I have a picture somewhere of Bob playing those wow, mallets. I'd love to see that against the back door. That back door, second time mm-hmm. around. <laughs> yeah. So oh, I remember. Boy. Oh, I'd love to see that. Bob would. I'd have to Bob find would it. die. Dan, it was yeah, and, and like I say, him and I, some guy. Named Dan with the mellow hair, who actually played with us as the Cheeses from France at that one show with that on, which was, which in some ways I think had to be our crowning achievement. <laughs> was it Ed, was it the future? Yeah, no, was it the future? Was it Ed Ott in the future? Because mm-hmm. Ed Ott was doing fairly well. Uh, he yeah. was he was pulling in crowds. Yeah, the future uh, was. Yeah, yeah, and they were playing at skits. Was it called skits or Caesars or whatever the fuck it was called at the time? They were they were playing two sets and they asked if we would come and play the set between their two sets. Now you remember this is the show that you gave Brad Garten or somebody gave Brad Garten a bunch of mushrooms, and then no, I'm sorry, somebody else gave him the mushrooms. You handed him the camera. You said, "I don't want to film it. Why don't you film it?" Oh, I've never filmed anything before. That'd be great. Was, this was at Caesar's, yeah, the skits or yeah. whatever. It was and so. At the time. Uh, so, you know, when you watch the videotape, he's, like, taking the camera, turning it upside down, playing with the white balance, messing with the keys that form the word. The cryons. Yeah. And it, it just... Well, anyway, so Ed has got a respectable crowd there. I'd say probably 70 to 100 people in there. Doing good. They're all drinking. They're all having a good old time. They're digging on what Ed's pushing out. And, and he says, okay, we're going to work in a back for a second set. In the meantime, enjoy the cheeses from France. Now... Anyone who's seen the cheeses from France knows that the word enjoy shouldn't have been in that sentence. <laughs> and um, and we chased literally like two-thirds of that place out the door. When Ed came back on to play, there was like ten people out there. Mm-hmm. And the guy who owned the place was so shitty. Yeah, he didn't I mean, have a sense of humor. He had no... He yelled at us. Uh, he, like, helped throw our stuff out into the I remember, the door. yeah, where Jimmy Hoffa played there, and he didn't yeah. have much of a sense of humor about that either. Right, but the funny part about it was... Is you know he told us we were never going to play there again that we were banned and blah blah blah. You're blacklisted, exactly. buddy. Exactly. You You're should. blacklisted. You'll never play in this town again. Yeah, or eat lunch. And, uh, and so we, uh, he didn't know, I guess, that we were already booked there like the next week under a different name. Uh, that was you were with the Carmel Police. We were Yodel like mad. It was, yeah, Yodel like mad. The Carmel Police, which is basically all of the same people in the cheeses of France, just split into two groups. I love it. <laughs> And when we walked in the door with our stuff, he was like, huh? Yeah, and we're like, well, you already booked us. I mean, you know, we can leave if you want, but... Yeah, that was the us. same guy who uh, found it uh, just as humorous when Carmel Police did our version of uh, Close to You the same night that uh, like Karen that. Carpenter had died. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we, made, we made it up on the spot. <laughs> he, yeah, he did. Because we, we, we played two nights, and we heard from various people that uh, he told anyone that called, do not come tonight. Yeah. <laughs> what, well, I guess I guess he didn't like I guess he didn't like authentic blues music. Okay, you know some people just don't get it. Yeah, you know we we can dish it out, but you don't have to get it. So. Mm-hmm. I remember that show not being very well attended either. 
<laughs> the second one. The second one, for sure. That was, that was when I had that bangs fetish. Mm-hmm. But before I got the cure hair, do you remember? I let my bangs grow <laughs> down past below yeah. my chin. I thought that, that was your new romantic phase. Whatever it was, I just I said, you know, I wonder how long I can get these. And I just let them go and let them go. <laughs> and I, the videotape of that show, I'm hunched over playing the drums. And my face is completely halfway covered up, like... Uh, Veronica Lake style, basically, <laughs> just with my bangs hanging down below my chin. <laughs> and I think right after that, I was like, I don't like that look. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try something else. And that's when I tried the big poofy hair. You know, and that experiment ended with the, with the stink bug. So you remember that, right, Dave? I, you, well, you were kind of, you were gone at this point, And I was, I would hang upside down. I had some inversion boots. Inversion down the bars. And I'd hang upside down while I did my hair. And uh, and so I'd get a bunch of final net in there, and I'd scrunch it up, you know, and then I'd have, like, wild-ass hair all over the place, you know, kind of like what was the big deal back then. And I remember, you know, everybody, like, people would laugh at me. I'm walking down the street. I remember once at the Woodland Theater, this woman behind me, I heard her lean over and go, it's like trying to watch a movie from behind a bush. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then finally, one night, some band... It was after Weezing Combo, but it was before the Math Bats. We were doing that Trouble is in Your Set show. And I had to come home and do something to my hair before I went on or something. And I came home, and I'm dragging a comb through. Now, the trick to getting your hair to stay like that, especially when you got real fine hair like mine, is to not wash it for like three or four days at a time. Which is, I only wash my hair like once or twice a week back then. I'm surprised I didn't have dreads. So, and I'm going through there, I'm going, da 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 And I hit this snag, this like... <laughs> And I'm like, God damn, what the, what the hell? So I'm reaching in my hair, you know, and I'm parting everything out, and I feel this clump. And I'm like, what the hell? So I take out a pair of scissors, and I go like this. And you know those big, crunchy-ass June bugs that, like, bang against your porch yeah. light at night? Yeah. One of those had gotten stuck in my hair and died. <laughs> oh, my God. And it died? It, yeah, it was dead. It had probably been there for, like, a day or two. It got stuck in all the final net. And, uh, <laughs> what an awful way to die, too. I know. <laughs> Death by new romanticism, <laughs> you know. Oh, it's almost as tragic as that new romantic snack bar, remember? Oh, hey, you got mustard on my frock. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so, uh, yeah, like the next day I was like, fuck this, man. And, I, and that's when I started just doing it Elvis style because I just couldn't, I couldn't fathom any more bugs in there. It was, it was bad. It's it pretty was, disgusting. It was it? disgusting. So, now after Weezing Combo, Mike, you ended up playing with Paul Mahern, right? Dandelion abortion. Right. And that was, what year was that? Do you remember? 83, probably. Going into 84. Because that's probably, when, that was right around then was when I finally started seeing a lot of local bands. Uh, probably because Bill Levin would book us all the time and we'd just already be there. Yeah, they we, we had played shows with Dandelion abortion, remember? We played at the Woodbridge Clubhouse. That's where Bill Woods Edge. Woods Edge. That's, yeah. where, that's where Bill grabbed my girlfriend's boob. Mm. She uh, she didn't have a sense of humor either. Did she, did she? Not about that. <laughs> Not about that. Uh, and 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 you know how it was because that was back when Bill drank. You remember how Bill was when he drank? Mm. You know he was very like goofy and and we were standing there talking and he was saying something about our version of Doctor Love or something and then he was ah, yeah Doctor Love honk honk <laughs> like that. That's how he did it. Mm. And she just got <clears throat> this look on her face like like somebody just told her that her family was in a plane crash. <laughs> it was that bad. It was just like, and I knew it. And when he did it, I had this, this sudden rush just came right over me. Like I knew right then and there that either I had to punch him or I had to laugh. It was one or the other. And I wasn't going to punch Bill of it. I was like, I thought it was kind of fun. I mean, okay, it wasn't right. But at the time, I was probably a little drunk. And I thought it was kind of funny. And after the after was that the end of that relationship? It was towards the end, but it wasn't the end though. And uh, when we got outside, she was like, "Why didn't you defend my honor? Why didn't you hit him?" And, you know, and I knew I knew I'd get it back at the end. You know, Bill would have a girlfriend, and he'd let me do it to her. So. <laughs> <laughs> Uh-huh. Oh, this sounds incredibly un PC. I hope I don't get any hate mail. No, it's not whether you'll get some, it's how much hate mail will you get. Oh, all right. Well, we have an address people can send the steaming vitriol to. So. But anyway, so we, we'd played at least a couple shows with right. Dandelion Abortion, and then 
So I joined them. Terry had been playing with them, and that hadn't been working out. And Paul was Terry Hollywood. Terry Hollywood. I didn't realize that. Yeah, yeah. For some reason, I thought that when the Zero Boys broke up the first time, he was sort of persona non grata. Not true. He was still around. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. 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 Yep, he had, he played uh, he had played with them and that wasn't working out and Paul was I just couldn't believe that I had a chance to play with Paul cuz <laughs> needless to say he was a he was a legend from the Zero Boys and sure. uh, and to play with uh, Spliff and and Bam Bam like the greatest the Ian Brynos the, the, the Ian Brynos and they were 3 p.m. before that so Fact, they you had, remember when 3 p.m. used to come down to third base for the No Wave dance parties mm-hmm Yep, back in the day. Okay, so that was uh, okay. Oh, no, that was that was kind of three p.m. Ian Bryan's Dandelion abortion. That was that. Okay, be- between twenty one forty seven and third base, is that where Crazy Alice fits in? Yeah, because we haven't talked about. No, Crazy no, Crazy Alice, Alice was after third base. After it was third, right. It, no, no, when Crazy Alice came along, third base kind of didn't need to be there anymore. Third base was was act- literally filling a void. In for a place for for these punk and new wave mm-hmm. bands to play because almost any band could get in there. I think your parents played down there. The Future played down well, there. Yeah, I mean, all these bands would play down there. Believe me, any band could play but, third base because the Jesus played there twice. Cra- crazy Crazy Al's eclipsed that because uh-huh. it was it was a better bar and right. I mean it was a nicer stage. It was better on the location. North South. Yeah. yeah, North Side, either free parking or really cheap parking. Right. It just had a lot going for it that third base didn't, and so I think third base. Third base had kind of run its right. course when Crazy Owls came along. Now, were you you weren't the official sound man there, but they asked you to do sound when a lot of I did it up until town, right. I did it up until uh, their New Year's Eve show. Okay, when the Jetsons played, and to this day, I still hear about. Before that show, anyone who was at that show was struck by the avant-garde use of a ring modulator in the PA system. Uh And before that show, Jamie Jetson had come in the second time around, and he said, I want you to do something with the audio so that it's really cool. I mean, I want you to kind of experiment and play around with it. I said, well, we have a ring modulator we could plug into it. And Mike, of course, you remember what a ring modulator sounds like. Yeah, yeah exactly. So I, I plugged the ring modulator into uh, the soundboard. Uh-huh. And so every once in a while, and, and, and Brad was helping me, and Brad and I really weren't of a state of mind that we should have been running that soundboard. This was during your acid phase, wasn't it? I, I don't want to get into details. All but right. we, we, we shouldn't have been running that soundboard with a ring modulator. Because, <laughs> because the, the, just every once in a while, the band would be up there playing, and then the, 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 the PA would go, like that and then everyone in the in crazy Alice would turn and look at look at me and i just sort of shrug like i don't know what's wrong and then we'd kind of carry on uh, dave myers and steve cohen never called me again to do audio really? for, uh, for crazy Alice. yeah but luckily i'd had the cramps had been through there right and so i have a, a really nice i still have it a 10 inch reel a master reel of the cramps at Crazy Alice. And Owls. DNA, right, too? I have DNA. MX-80? I have, I have um, MX-80. I have the Ray Beats. Um, it's not at Crazy Owls, but I have that Ramones show. Right. In fact, I've been thinking it'd be fun to get that, that master tape out of the Ramones mm-hmm. and have kind of a, a listening party for it. Play it one more time. Well, you know, a lot of people still feel that's like the best live recording. Yeah, it is. The best. It, it, it is. It, it, it's amazing, yeah. It's great. And you because did that on a two-track, right? Uh, or a it, was, it was a quarter track reel to reel deck. Yeah. It's the greatest because at the beginning you can hear the we harmonizer. Are two track the, 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 yeah. the harmonizer on Joey's vocal. Yeah. Yes. We oh, and, and, the, and, the, and the drum, the marching drum. Yeah, 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 yeah. No ring modulator at all, huh? No. <laughs> Luckily, I wasn't in charge of the audio for that. <laughs> But we, we'd like to thank the late Dutch novel. Yeah, I mean, I have, a, I have a handful of recordings from, from around that time from either Al's or, or uh, um, let's see, I think, oh, the Bush Tetras. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's Al's right, yeah. Have the Bush Tetras. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of these bands that, that Al's would bring through, I'd pop a cassette in and, and borrow the cassette deck from a uh, second time round that Bob Phillips had bought. The Nakamichi? No, it wasn't a Nakamichi. It was an Advent. Oh, that's right. The, one, was, the one with the weird record button, Yeah, right? the, the weird thing was it was it recorded in stereo, but there was only one VU meter on it. Uh-huh. So you were never quite sure what, what you were getting there. <laughs> but You know, of all the various memories I have of Crazy Owls, the one that I remember the most, and I'm pretty sure you were there, and I know you were there, 
But do you remember when we were standing on the corner talking? It was either between sets or after the show or something. Just standing there in the corner, and that guy pulls up in a car. Do you remember this? I, I do. Kind and of he goes, this. "Fuck you, motherfucker!" like that. And then there's that pause. And he looks out the window closer, and he goes, "Oh, uh, my faux pas." <laughs> that takes off. <laughs> and that—that's what I remember the most about Crazy Owls. Man, there was great shows at Crazy Owls. Yeah, I, I think Dave and Steve did a great job of, of bringing it. I, I don't think they made any money at it, but no, I they did a nice did. job. Now, that's what the, the Jazz Kitchen is now, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. X played they there. They seem to be doing okay. They've had jazz there for many years. Yeah. Maybe they It's also a nice jazz. restaurant, too, so I'm that's sure that. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah, actually, the food there is really good. The food's, food is very good. We went there a couple of years ago, and I was really impressed with how the good food, the food is. Food is very nice. Yeah. Who did you see? Who knows? It was a tribute to Freddie Hubbard or something like that. Yeah, they do stuff like that. Their their shows are a little pricey, but it's a nice place to see. They are. Bands. I tried to go see Maceo Parker there a couple months ago, and it was sold out before I got my ticket. Well, I've been there very few times since it was Crazy Owls, and so you know it's hard to go in there if you have fond memories of Owls. Well, it's real hard, and and not think about everything that, that happened there in the short period of, of time that Crazy Owls was there. The Phoenix I, video machine, video right. game machine sitting there. I'm pretty and... sure that the three of us, the last time we ever went to Owls, or maybe it was just me and you, I don't remember, but do you remember going there and they had just gotten there whatever it was called, the, the subscription service where they sent them a VHS tape. Oh, yeah. yeah. 20 right. videos wow. on it. Yeah. What the heck and they that? showed they showed Level Terrace Apart, oh. which we had never seen before. <laughs> And they showed, uh, you know, a bunch of new romantic stuff that we were neither here nor there about. I think that's where we came up with the joke about the new romantic snack bar. And then, uh, but what we remember was was they had the uncensored version of Girls on Film. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. Yeah. Did, yeah. yeah. To and, this and, day, I, I have fond memories of that. I mean, you know, I remember just, just looking up at it, thinking like, God, you can do that? <laughs> really? The Ice Cube? Yes. I mean, and this was the uncensored version. I mean, it's not like the one you'd see on MTV later on. Yep, they would every month they would get a new uh, yeah. new videotape just full of cool I remember stuff this of- was this was pre MTV, so uh, videos were, were kind of rare. You wouldn't see them very often, and when you did, you know, you never knew when you were going to see them again. Um, well, a tip of the hat to uh, Rick Wilkerson for putting out the Crazy Owl CD. Uh, yeah. Two CD set, what, about a year and a half ago? Uh-huh. Man, if, if you don't have that, you need to seek that out, because it is a amazing collection of just everyone that was around at that time, and a lot of it had never been heard until... Rick. Until Rick and Rick some of it together. should never be heard. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, Kings of the No Wave Mountain. If you don't like it, fuck off. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I'm not the one that's afraid to play again. <laughs> Crickets. Yes. Crickets. Crickets. Well, you know, the last show we did probably should be our last show, but I mean, well, I don't think we'll ever get Eric to do it. So. Well, well, I, I, well, I have one other comment I, just, I want to make if, about if, if If we're going to do it, it's going to be 2112. It has to be 2112. I, I want to make one more comment about Crazy Owls. Because, you know, there, there are people that, that I know today and have known for a few years who talk about going to Crazy Owls, and I swear to God, I don't remember them there. Mm-hmm. And I have this theory that there were, in, in, there was, there were two crazy owls there was the crazy owls that had kind of the pop bands Mm -hmm. that 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 our group had no interest in and then there was the crazy owls that would bring in the bush tetras and dna and the more experimental bands that we were always there and i think that just the crowds didn't overlap very much no do do you also remember and boy we've never talked about this what you and i probably invented i'm not sure i'm not sure where you're going here kamikaze pogo oh oh did we invent that? Yes. We did it, and then we did it in Chicago when we would go... Okay, what were you saying about Crazy Owls? All right. So, and, and, I, and, and Steve Cohen and David uh, Shadow Myers right. even called it the L4D contingent to describe those people who were going to the avant-garde shows that Crazy right. Owls would, would be putting on once in a while. Yeah, because, because I mean, uh, other than the, the avant-garde stuff, they had the positions played all the time, and... And they'd have all those, like, uh, remember how we used to call them skinny tie bands back then? Yes, lots of skinny we tie bands. We hated skinny tie bands. I mean, now, I mean, I don't care how they dress, but back then, I think we, we were pretty anti-skinny tie bands. And I, if we saw a poster with a band that had skinny ties and, like, some sort of checkered motif, we probably would, would not have gone. 
So yeah, there probably was a contingent of people. There totally did, was because yeah, there was. Shows. We definitely had, you know, even the people who went to come see our, you know, us as a band was definitely different than, you know, the those who were, were going to see yeah, Randy, but, Randy right, but, but then there was I would go see both, you know, yeah. and and there so there was this big group of you know the, here, and there was another group over here, and then there was people that you know kind of went and saw both, but I never heard him say the L four D contingent, but I totally see that as being a being a thing you know it was probably all of us that were dna it was in, yeah. it was in either what hot potato or one of those yeah there was actually an, uh, an interview with one or both of them and they and they actually used the term really D contingent yeah. maybe, wow maybe it was a not quite daily dog pardon me maybe it, was it could not, have been them not, the not yeah. quite daily dog. who yeah. was the publisher of that i don't <laughs> remember i don't believe he was ever named <laughs> When we were off mic here, Mike, you were telling a story, a funny story about somebody you met. First time I saw the, uh, met the uh, latex novelties. I think that was it. Would yeah. that be it? I think that sounds right. Because we were talking about earlier bands yeah. and back to the Urban Gorilla Pop Festival and all that. So um, this goes back to high school or right after high school. And uh, I had like great friends, but my God. They didn't have great taste in music, <laughs> believe me. And this was a perfect example. So one of our friends lived at Wingate. So we'd obviously, uh, some people had moved out and got their own places. So they were having a, a party at Wingate Apartments, which I believe was 42nd and Franklin. It was on the northeast side or whatever. And um, so we'd go in this party in the... Highlight of that party was playing the new Moody Blues album. <laughs> and, yeah, so they were all excited to be listening to the new Moody Blues album. And, and it wasn't even their early stuff. <laughs> yeah. And one of us wasn't particularly as interested as the rest of them. So I went out on the the, uh, the patio. They had little uh, little deck things outside. And... I'm out there by myself, and I hear this ruckus coming. This was on the second floor. This ruckus coming from down below, and I kind of am hanging over the uh, the rail. And here is a giant Ramones poster or flyer or something covering up the sliding patio window. Uh -huh. And it was kind of like, oh my god, it was happening again. So <laughs> I I crawled over the patio <laughs> and dropped down to the next floor and just kind of. Opened the door and invited myself in. And this was the back door, right? This, well, I guess the north, south, east. Yes, right. it was the back door. Thank you. Right. The back door and, man. It yeah. was. And uh, opened the door, and there was the uh, original lineup of the latex novelties just hanging out, playing. And you had never know, met them? Before? Oh, no, no. Peter no, Pills. No. And it was Pills and. Mo Geek. Yep, yep. They were that original. That original contingent, so that was uh, that was <laughs> that was kind of like another moment for you me. Jumped like, over a balcony. I jumped, <laughs> yeah. In retrospect, you know, maybe not the smartest idea, <laughs> but uh, yeah, just to, I'm here. They're listening to the Moody Blues upstairs, and they're listening to Ramones downstairs, and that's where I spent the rest of the evening. <laughs> so, now, Dave, do you remember you were the one that got the phone call, the famous John Cale phone call? Do you remember? I heard that story when you were talking to. Uh, yeah, that was Paul you. Mayhern. You remember yeah. that, don't you? Yeah, because you. I think you laughed for like a good two days after that. Oh, I thought it was hilarious. Yeah. I mean, we got the wrong Cale. John Cale. <laughs> I remember going over and listening to his sound check, uh -huh. and that was that was pretty cool. And then asking him for an autograph, and he just. He pretty much just said "fuck off." He does, yeah, he's you know I I think he said on the Mark Maron podcast that that he doesn't do art, and he and apparently he never has. Huh. But well, I've heard he's a little bit on the grumpy side. It's what I hear. I can't he's say an for artist. sure. Tony, he's an artist. Well, he was only on. Was it just the first album? First two. First two albums. Nico was on the first album. Yeah. Yeah, so, well, actually, you know, why don't you tell that story so we don't leave people hanging who didn't listen to it? Well, I, or I could just refer it, refer it back to the, the Paul You could, Mayer. but that's someone's got to do a bunch of legwork. So just go ahead and tell you, because you were there. You were the one. You answered the phone. Oh, I was, I was, I was at second time around, and, and I kind of know this stuff. And, and, and we had, the store had a reputation for being knowledgeable. And the phone rang, and I picked it up, and it was so-and-so from uh, Sunshine Promotions. And they wanted to know if John Cale was the same as J.J. Cale. And I said... No, John Cale was in the Velvet Underground, and J.J. Cale wrote 
cocaine, I think it was. And so, it, yeah, that was when I, I heard him say, We got the wrong kale. Yeah, wrong kale. Wrong <laughs> kale. Un- it was unbelievable. And they, and they simulcast it, too, on Q95. I, don't, I, to this day, don't know how that happened. It's kind of like that, that, that Elvis Costello concert. I mean, sponsored by a radio station that never played him. Yeah. But, but Tom Robinson was a Q95. He and, was. And, and he, he was, was fun. And he was... He had become. Did you a ever good... go over with me to hang oh, yeah. out a oh, couple we, of times? Hung, yeah, he, he's a Facebook friend of mine now. Is he I really? finally tracked him down. Do you remember yep. when he when he's, he was from Boston? Do you remember yep. that? And he said that when he was in Boston, Willie Loco Alexander was like the, the cool band mm. up there, and the Cars were like these this these bunch of dumbasses. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and mm-hmm. uh, and then lo and behold, sure, that's yep. the way it happens. But but he became friends of ours, and he he had good taste in music. He wasn't he allowed, did, but he wasn't he allowed, wasn't to, allowed to express it very right. often. Well, let's face <laughs> but, it, radio um, around here, as far as punk rock was concerned, they they were not only not interested, they were they were vehemently not interested. Now, and, and, and a good a good example of this is you remember every Sunday night they would play with the King Biscuit Flower was, Hour, right? Every Sunday night. We knew that there was an Elvis Costello King Biscuit Flower Hour coming up. We'd seen a schedule in some national magazine. Like, all right, next Sunday. And they put blah, yellow blah, blah. on instead something, or something. Yeah, but they, and instead they repeated something else, something they'd already had on there. <clears throat> and we called down to the station, and Charlie Brown, I guess either you knew Charlie Brown. Sure. Or yeah, he used to come into the store. And we asked him, we said, hey, you know, last night was supposed to be Elvis Costello, but they didn't play it. Why not? And he goes, because it's Elvis Costello. We mm-hmm. don't play that shit. And so, if you remember, we I think we paid him like ten bucks or something, or gave we somehow there was some exchange of something in order for him to make us a cassette because he had the disc for the for that show, <clears throat> and he made us a, a cassette of it, and we had to go down to the station to pick it up. But yeah, they wouldn't even play a King Biscuit Flower Hour that it, that was on their schedule to be played. Well, which it, I assume they had some sort of a contract, maybe even in Indianapolis, it. punk and new wave, whose seed could find no purchase in this town. <laughs> Yeah, I mean there was there was zero interest in the media right. unless it was like you know ooh Sex Pistols kind of stuff. Sure, and that's why we started going to see shows out of town. You remember? I mean, it was almost there for a while. It seemed like we were going up to Chicago or Cincinnati. Probably every couple of weeks we were going somewhere. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there were times where I'd be up there like virtually two or three times a month, and we saw some great shows there that you know had we waited, we never would have seen. Well, you them. never would have seen those bands. That that public image show. Uh, to this, oh to my this God. day, the one where they were throwing money, the one, the mm. one where his guitar sounded like a bunch of electrified screeching hornets. Remember that? Yeah. Like when they came out, there's a. Th- it was an th- amazing th- 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 show. That was the that, original public <clears throat> image. Yeah. Jaw wobble and Keith yes. Levine. Yep. And remember how loud that bass was? It, yes. it, it almost made you throw up. It was that uh, that's it was a synthesizer, I think, where it go. Yeah. And when it hit that low register, yeah. and just the whole the whole building would shake. Yeah. Now I'm going to go ahead and remember the open. I was going to say, I was going to spin my tale about the opening. Go ahead. A skinny tie band who we were not into, We and, and they were horrible, too. They were remember, horrible. Well, okay, they wait, also, let, me back up. let me back up. Maybe they weren't horrible, but they were not well matched with no, the band they were playing. In any way, shape, or form. <laughs> and so, you know, so they're up there, and they're playing this sort of like light, sort of new wave, stompy sort of dance. <laughs> and after every song, people are booing, like loudly booing yeah. and screaming, I calling them that. names and like everything. And after every song, I remember like, Thank you. Thank yeah. you. You guys are great. Thank you. <laughs> okay, this next song is. And then they go into another song just like it. And the g- people are getting louder and they're screaming and they're booing. And then there's that moment that we all remember. The, the guitar player is going to take a solo, which, you know, it wasn't a good crowd for taking a solo. And he puts his foot up on the monitor so his leg is extended. And he's like this. And then that cup. Yeah, the cup. It, just, it took it took the, like two years to get to his. Like, it was it was, it was so forever. big. Just, everyone everyone remembers that in slow motion. It was it slowly was just, tumbling. It was We're all looking, perfect. going, "Is it going to hit was a direct that hit. right on his leg? Boom! Splash, Splattered everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> thank you, thank you. You guys are great. Thank you. And two weeks later, they played a crazy ass. <laughs> <laughs> they they did. Yeah. Oh, but but yeah, that show. Okay, but do you remember throwing the everyone throwing money up? Yes. Jo- Johnny Rotten walking around walking the stage, through. picking up 
quarters. Pen- pennies and quarters. Yeah. yeah. And sticking they, them in his pocket. Yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. And they threw some buttons back, remember? Because we got some buttons. It wasn't a very long show. I remember the about 40 minutes, maybe. Oh, it did. It, did. it was. It, was, it didn't have to be any longer. No, it, was, it didn't. It, it was, was heaven. And, the, you know, Ja Wobble left shortly after that. Oh, I know. Even, and that was, the, that was the time to see that. I think so, too. I think so, too. Yeah, his bass parts were, my God. Oh, he was so important oh, to that band. Lord. But then, uh, uh, what you you saw? Did you go up to see the Jam with us at Park West? Yes, Park West. I still uh, had the poster. It was an autographed poster. Right. We met them. They did an in-store appearance at, at uh, Wax Tracks. Yeah, and then I have those pictures of you talking with Steve Diggle from the Buzzcocks from that show before. And then, uh, well, who? Else? Okay, now, see, I didn't see Paruba the first time you guys went to see them, but I did see them the at second Gaspers. time. Gaspers, right? Now <sighs> that was the show to see. Did you go up as, for that? As I understand, that it. was like when they did Final Solution. Right, I had true. never heard anything to this I don't day. Know that, I don't know that I'd heard a band that played synthesizers like that, and we're there, and I'm just like, oh my god, and the, these synthesizers were coming out of oh, nowhere. And, and Scott and, Krause's like oh, his, his drum geez. beat. I mean, he just he just had all those songs had had momentum to them. They had inertia going forward. It was just, a, you know, everyone has probably. I'll, I'll bet I, I would think everyone at this table and everyone listening to this podcast has a half dozen shows that they've been to in their lives that they will never forget right. because it brought out some kind of emotion that that they'd never felt before. Like the vibrator show I told you about at the sure. Hammersmith Odeon would have been like that. That that uh, that show with Per Ubu at Gaspers. Oh my God. It was just um, unbelievable. That Oh God, it was incredible. Mm. Yep. We saw a lot of... Or a magazine. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> That you know, a, looking back on that show, it might not have been as bad as we thought it was. I think we just were kind of maybe hyper picky. I'm, well, and I'm not sure that I was in a mindset because yeah. everything was pretty funny that night. And when it he, was. I when, think that might have been during both of our phases. When he, uh, yeah, when he said, "What is it? My mind sl- La Lubiere say shaft them wall." Yeah, that one too. My mind slides. What shut, shut like, like a sliding, sliding door. door. And yeah. he just had such a. We funny were way laughing so hard. I mean, it just seemed like. And, well, and that was after we saw. <laughs> Bowie and the Elephant Man. Right. And Bowie apparently showed up at that show uh-huh. and was at the back for part of it. Yeah. Wow, I didn't know that. And that See, was... I don't remember seeing, but I was probably not like you guys. I, I don't remember Magazine being quite so funny. Rick Wilkerson but... loved it. Rick Wilkerson yeah. couldn't figure out why the hell we were laughing. He, and, was, he was, man, that was a great show. What are you guys laughing at? I'm sure it was. <laughs> oh my I'm God. Sure yeah, it was, yeah, it it was absolutely been. that. And well, the same thing with Susie and the Banshees. Well, that one, okay, that's a classic story that we'll have to tell, and then we're going to move on to the doc. All right. Okay, so when we went up to see Susie and the Banshees, which was probably a good two or three years after we should have, I think, anyway. I, 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 yeah, I, I agree. I, and, and, and so, and you remember, you always used to tell me, and I remember it, there's, there's a time to see everybody. Right. And then there's a time to not see. So, and I, if you remember, we're driving along Lakeshore Drive, we're around in that corner where Milt Trenier's Lounge is, and we noticed a sign that said, you know, tonight, the, the Treniers. The Treniers, yeah, I remember that. And we loved and the Jim, Treniers. Jim was with us, I yeah. think. We, and we, we'd had that reissued album that had just come out, the one that had Get Out of the Car and Poontang and, yeah. and all the stuff in it. And, uh, and we were like, oh, man, I wonder if it's, if it's, should we get out of the show early enough? Maybe we can go check out the It was the like Treniers. a Holiday Inn or something. It was Milton Treniers Lounge is connected to some hotel or yeah. something. And uh, so we go to the show. And if you remember, Susie came out, like, really late. They were, like, a good hour to an hour and a half late coming yes. out. And then when they did come out, they didn't say anything. They scowled at us. They, like, played most of the show facing the it, other it direction. It really looked like they didn't even want to be there. They, they really looked like they wanted us to get so pissed off that we would stop the show early so they could go home and do something yeah, else. Yeah, there was, was no encore. It nothing. Was just, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was honestly one of the worst fucking shows I've ever seen in And that my was life. my recollection, And it was expensive, too. too. It was expensive. It was a pain in the ass to get there. It was hot as hell. It was just horrible. So we get out. We're like, like fuck this. We got it. We got it. Cleanse the palate. Let's go see if we can go see the Treneers. And here was like midnight or something, yeah. isn't it? But, it? but it just so happens the Treneers were putting on their set, that like two shows per night or whatever, and they had a second show. We get to the door, and I'm sure we're not dressed for the dinner crowd set. I, uh, me particularly, I'm sure. I'm sure I'm probably wearing nasty shorts and something. Right. Bag. I mean, we were dressed for a punk rock Some, show. Maybe in a racer head t-shirt or something. Who knows? <laughs> but anyway, so we get there, and the guy looks at us. And we're like, you know, we, we want to see the Treneers. And he wouldn't let us in. He was like, you're not explain really... Explain who the Treneers are. They were, were they were like a hip sort of semi-swing kind of slash R- rock band. R&B kind yeah, of... Yeah, from the, from the 50s who did sort of like a, a jump swing sort of deal, you know, uh... 
kind of kind of rock and roll, kind of kind of jazz. It was kind of like like, like the real fish early foul. kind of the purest rock yeah. and roll. Yeah. But 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 we liked it. And we wanted to see them, you know. And like, it was like the, they were already old. It's like when, when else are we gonna get a chance to see the Turniers? So the guy says, you know, you're just you're just not you're not dressed for it, you know. He says, he says I don't want to be mean or anything, but you just you just this is a this is a dinner club, and we're like, oh man, we drove all. We kind of fudged this a little bit. We're like, oh man, we drove all the way well, from Indianapolis. And then, to and see then you the started Turniers. naming some of the songs. Yeah. You said, "Get out of the car," well, and I mean, and, and so the guy was convinced that we were legit. Yeah. That, so what he did, if you remember, he took us to the back table, the back corner right. table. He blew out the candle. We were in the and shadows. He unscrewed the light bulb out <laughs> from over our table. So, so, so we're in this back. Black, dark corner. The trainers come out, you know, and they're hipping and they're swinging, and we're like going, "Poon Tang, get out of the car!" Yeah, so we're like we're like screaming, uh, uh, you know, suggestions. And every time we do, they look at us like, "Who in the hell?" Why? Well, I, I got the impression that they were pretty impressed with that. Well, they came over and talked to us afterwards. Remember, they came over to it's our like, table. Who are you guys? Yeah, they're like, "Who are you?" We're like, "Oh, we got this album. We really love it." Blah 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 blah. And they were, and honestly, that show was as good as the other show was bad. Mm-hmm. And honestly, you know, you talk about like light bulb nights. That was kind of a night where I kind of started backing off of a lot of like goth and sort of like good. Just I was like, well, I, I was I, like, this is entertaining, and this was. I not. remember the show real well. It had a little bit of a of like a Las Vegas lounge act right. feel to it, sure, which we probably weren't used to, right? But. We really appreciated what these guys were doing up there. Yeah. And it was really fun watching them uh, continue the craft that they'd started 25, 30 years earlier. Right. Whenever it was that they kind of created the band. And I had a feeling it hadn't changed much in all that time. But whenever we would yell out the name of a song, they would do it. Yes, they did it, right. Yeah. Whereas Susie and the Banshees, if you would have named out a song that was probably on their set list, they probably would have marked it off. Oh, they, oh you want to hear that one? Let me mark it off. Yeah, yeah. they'd throw a drink at us. Yeah. You know. Uh, do you remember was it Las Vegas or Lake Tahoe when we were seeing that country lounge band and they asked and they asked for a request <laughs> and we said honky tonk blues always honky tonk blues and they all turned to you and they're like do you, do you know that one oh you mean honky tonkin no no no, no, no. honky tonk blues is a Hank Williams song and they're like, yeah do you know that no. and they didn't know it wow they fucking didn't know it yeah. we're like are you kidding me. <laughs> What, what, what is what, what's the old saying? It's all hat and no horse, or something like that. <laughs> yeah, <nice. laughs> all right. Well, well, let's let's jump forward a little bit. Actually, we'll jump jump here towards the end here. We mentioned radio earlier, and radio has actually come up several times during this talk. You mean about how like WNAP and Q ninety five couldn't give a shit about any of this music we've been talking about for the last hour or so? Pretty much, yeah. And uh, so anyway, you, I might as well didn't you uh, win? Uh, a Pulitzer recently? Or was I'm not it sure it was a Pulitzer. Nobel Peace Prize? Was it, he won something. Won an, something. Emmy, an Emmy. Oh, an Emmy. That's yeah, right. I, had ah. some, I had something to do with a, a movie, a documentary called Naptown Rock Radio Wars, which, which was uh, a labor of love for four years. Oh, thank you. Thank it's you. It's beyond amazing. Well, you're nice to say that. No, it is. Uh, it, it, took, it took four years to make it, and I, I, no one underwrote it. It was just one of those things we would work on. I have a video production company, and we work on it in our spare time. Right. And we go out and conduct interviews. And I'll tell you one thing, though, about Chris Connor. I'll tell you this. Um, you know, I always thought, and I, I, don't, I don't know if I want him to hear this or not, that Chris Connor was kind of part of that, you know, Joe Walsh and, and you know, that, that 70s hair, not hair band, but... The kind of music that you generally, yeah, that you generally would associate with NAP or Q95. Right. He was over at my house one time, and I put on a record, and I said, "Who do you think this is?" It was a female vocalist. I played about thirty seconds of it. And he goes, "Is that Nico?" And you about die. <laughs> I did. It was like, I, like at that moment, I realized that this was a guy who had a, an on-air persona, uh-huh. and he was the program director there, and he would help pick out the music. But that that was all. All his the corporate side of Chris Connor. Sure. That that the, the the other side of Chris Connor was that he loves music and that he knew who Nico was and he could recognize her voice, and I was so impressed with that. So having said all that, yeah, we have this documentary we did on Q ninety five. No, I'm sorry, it was about NAP and WIFE. Right. And uh, gosh, we. We, we had a, uh, a world premiere at the IMAX downtown Indianapolis at White River Park. We sold that out and even had a second showing that almost sold out. 
And then uh, a few months later, I realized it wasn't quite what I wanted it to be, so I flew down to Florida and interviewed Jim Hilliard and George Johns, uh -huh. who were very instrumental in, in WNAP. We integrated it, we re-edited it, and it had its uh, prime time showing on the PBS affiliate here. I may not have seen that particular version. It I was, think the version that you gave me it was, was when the you were one here with were Kevin before, right? Yeah, because you and Kevin were by here, and I was kind of showing it to anyone that I thought would be interested. Okay, I don't think I've seen this new version. Which is really, then. I think, a better version because I, I think add, could, adding Jim Hilliard and George Johns. If you who, can get me one of those, that'd be great. I can give it to you before you leave. Oh, be, but don't tell be anyone great. because then everyone will want one. Can well, I have one? If everybody I'm wanted sure. one, how would they go about getting one? <laughs> It's not available. Really? So they'd have to, like, basically download it illegally? They'd have to find it, yeah. They'd Through have to, other sources? Yeah, find it on, uh, Q9, uh, I'm sorry, on WFYI's broadcast schedule or find someone who has a copy of it. Which, Are there any plans to put it out? No, I, I, we have, all, what, like 80 songs or something in there, oh. none of which we have licensing to put out a DVD. I on. see. Uh, but the last song was The Stranglers doing 96 Tears. <laughs> and there was a reason for that, and that was my punk roots, which I, I, I could not avoid putting into that, that documentary. Right. What what made you want to get started doing that? I mean, it was just one day you were thinking, oh, that'd be a good story, or was there a specific kind of. thing that happened that... Yeah, there was um, a friend of mine, Al Stone, was the original program director for WNAP back in the, the 60s. And he and I had a, um, um, uh, we were having lunch or whatever one day, and he said, I have an idea for a documentary. And, uh, and I said, you know, I kind of have an idea for a documentary, too, because I'm trying to think, there was a newsman at WIBC who had just died. and was I can't Fred Heckman? No, it wasn't Fred. Because I'm not good at recognizing Fred Heckman. <laughs> Um, and I thought, you know, these, these broadcasters are, are disappearing and, and no one is, is getting their stories before they go. And right. so anyway, but Al Stone said, I, I have this idea for a, a documentary about the origins of rock radio in Indianapolis. And I said, you know, that kind of dovetails nicely with what my idea is for a documentary. And I have a video company and he had the connections. So we just kind of got together and started conducting interviews. I think we eventually conducted like 35 different interviews for that documentary. Mm. And uh, and it did it did very well. And to this day, I still get people emailing me asking how they can get a copy of it. And I say, eh, I wish I could help you out there. Oh. Yeah, I get the same with Cotton oh, Pick no, and I'll, Smash. I'll, I'll, I'll get you a copy of it. Well, I'll I'll keep it safe. Psst, I won't. Psst, I'm I'll, over here. I don't post don't it or tell anyone anything. All right. Yeah, Cotton. Now, what, what's the status of uh, the Ledge documentary? Oh, nothing. It's never going to go anywhere. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm going to give over my footage to these guys who are doing a new movie about him, and I'm going to wish them the best and hope it comes out well. Now what, who, who's doing a new movie about The Ledge? There's these guys out in New York who are doing a movie called Band in Outer Space. Uh, they actually talked to the guy from NASA who told me that story about... Uh, yeah, waking up the, the crew. Yeah, yeah they actually... Uh, well, I talked to them when I was there last year, and I told them, I said, you know that guy from NASA is still alive, right? They are like, no. I said, you know, he just lives down in Manhattan Beach, right? You could probably get him up here in a half hour, right? So after I left, they went and got in contact with him. And, but the thing is, a lot of the people that have anything to do with that either aren't interested in talking or they're dead. And I'm the only person that has the interview footage of these people that are now gone. So if they want that footage, it's either me or they don't have it. So... You know, all I ever wanted to do was help the ledge. I never expected to make any money off of it, and that's good because I'm not. So I'm just going to... You know, I have that footage we shot in New York of the ledge. Well, I was going to... If I can't find my copy, I was going to ask you if you could make me a, a copy of that again. I, I mean, I think I have it, but I had... This has nothing to do with it. I had an accident in my closet where basically the shelving broke. And so, like, all of my discs and all my boxes fell into a giant mountain mountainous pile. And I've yet to uh, go through and reorganize them yet so there's some things i can't find so if i need a copy of that I would and think, i've got I the would, hollywood show too i that i definitely don't have and i was which also, is and i was also going to ask if you still do you remember how packed that place was of all the photos that you took no, wait the, the still pictures yeah i need those too if you if you can what year was that 2008 uh, 2009 something like that I'll, i can look. but what you were saying do you remember how packed that show was in hollywood oh, yeah hey when the ledge plays people show my. up my God. Well, God, he has the tightest band around. I mean, it's an amazing oh, I band. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Yep. When I throw my hat up, stop when it hits the floor. That's when, <laughs> that's when I first learned that uh, In-Out Burger had a veggie burger. <clears throat> yeah, I know. 
That was so Oh, weird. the secret menu? Have you ever seen their secret menu? Yeah, I've heard the about wife's it. got a veggie burger. Yeah. We're looking at we're, them like, what the hell? We're driving down from uh, the Bay Area down there, and we're in two cars, and we stop at uh, In-Out Burger, and Ledge goes up and orders a veggie burger. And <laughs> it's like, what? And I'm looking at the menu. And so we get out, and it was a really nice day, and we're sitting at the little outside tables, and I'm going, I'm dying to see this, you know, veggie yeah. burger. Oh, it's so anticlimactic. <laughs> It's so it is. anticlimactic. I know. Here it comes. Yep. Yeah, yeah. You're you're thinking it's soy and mushroom and all sorts of exotic organic. It was lettuce and tomato and yeah. pickle it was, on it. Burger. Bun. They just took the batty off of it. Literally, yeah. literally there's just no yeah. burger yeah. between yeah. the yeah. buns. Everything, it's everything else but the burger. Yeah. Mustard, pickles, lettuce. Yeah. There it was. And that was his <laughs> veggie, was burger. veggie yes. burger. But they knew what he wanted. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm waiting for this like. Great, you know, ve- you know, the world's greatest nut and and, and mushroom and soy lentils and, and lentils and whatever. It was a bun with some lettuce and tomato on and it. And he was perfectly happy oh, with it. He was thrilled. Well, he yeah. asked for it. Yeah, well, here's, here's, here's something else funny. He doesn't eat meat except for 7-Eleven hot dogs. <laughs> wow. You know, he, we all have our will, peccadillos. He will eat 7-Eleven hot dogs, but he won't eat meat otherwise. <laughs> well, he's really not eating and their mind how would you describe the music that the digits played is it really you know how long it's been since I've heard any of that stuff though that's why I was trying to look at the song titles trying to figure out what I remember you guys you guys stopped doing Samoa after uh, after Joint Chiefs, Chiefs right yeah. although we did we did record a new version of it no you did huh yep well new version what four years ago mm. yep because that's like of all the stuff that we recorded that's like the only thing you played it live like. that's true more than once alright so tell me about the album and then we'll and then we'll cut out all right. Well, tentatively, we, we've put together, we found all these archive tracks of the last four four digits and the last four five digits, right. and we've put them together as side one and side two of a, of a, a vinyl release that will be coming out hopefully at the end of June in 2017. Not just vinyl, though, right? Funny you would ask. Okay, because I, I uh, got to ask. That's we my have, job. Th- there is a, a difference because there's also a CD version, and the CD version not only has an extra track, I Want to Be an Undertaker, but it also has a live version. Recording. Mike, what do you know about that live recording? I want to be an Undertaker. It's a pretty catchy tune. Why it's not on the vinyl. Why wouldn't you put that on the vinyl? Because it needed to be on the L440D side, and that was we were told by the pressing plant that we were we'd already maxed out the time. Really? That they're comfortable filling and up that, that was side. Kind of the one that didn't. Yeah, it, it, we, it's like we not having of, strawberry fields forever on Sgt. Pepper. <laughs> yeah, and how did that turn out? Not, not that great. It would have been nice to have that on there. It was an alternative version of Undertaker too. Right, I don't so, think anyone was that happy with it anyway. Yeah, but but listening to it, it's Steve per- sang perfect. that, right? No, uh, both and, and Richard, Richard Worth, and Steve sang it. Because I remember hearing it out of Steve's voice. Did the Joint Chiefs did he sing it? Joint Chiefs, uh, he and I sang it. Okay, and then for L four forty, Richard sang the part that I was singing. All right, but then. We talked earlier about this uh, East Coast tour that the last four or five digits went on. Right. And we played in we what, booked, Philadelphia, we, Washington, We booked DC, our own tour. Hoboken. We played Maxwell's. We had a week, and we just played the greatest clubs at the time, and many of them were still around. And, and Mike, Mike here is responsible for getting us into those clubs. and I, don't, I still don't know how he did it. But we played uh, 930 Club, and we played um, Eastside Club in Philadelphia, and we played um, Maxwell's, and, Maxwell's Hobo- and Hoboken Hoboken was the last show, and we played a really interesting show in a university in New York. In a lecture hall, there was there was a lot of seating available. <laughs> there, there was, but the crowning achievement of that tour was we played CBGBs. And 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 tell us about that show, Mike. Well, to play CBGBs, you had to go to what they called audition night, and so we expected to go there, and there would be like three people sitting, just really just probably drinking, and we played with probably five six other bands that night and then eventually um, they called our name and yeah we they just basically we got there and they kind of pointed to a dressing room and said sit here the bathroom, was it? no my god <laughs> <laughs> the most amazing quote-unquote bathroom in the world um but just but, think of the asses <laughs> whoa there was masses asses masses of asses masses of asses every they, every ass from every band in town had sat on that thing wow <laughs> and it hadn't been cleaned and, or flushed. 
dear. And uh, so they basically took us back to a dressing room that was full of graffiti with every great band that you could ever imagine played at CBGB's. And we basically sat there for our cattle call. And they called us out. And we played, I mean, I'm just... Just saying, we had practiced our butts off, and we played an amazing set. Turns out the sound guy was a master. Never heard us before, and at the end of our set, handed us a cassette and said, there there you go, which that is what is a bonus uh, on the CD and also is included in the LP. Right. Um, and we're leaving and looking over at the bar, sitting at the bar, Marky Ramone. Who sat through our set and didn't leave? Right there is great. That was didn't a plus. vote with his feet. Uh-huh. <laughs> he didn't vote with his feet. No, nope, nope. And then as we left that night, Hilly, the owner, came up to us and told us that we were like the greatest band that had played there, non, you know, an unknown band, I guess, right. and just could not stop talking about how wonderful we were and wanted to book us for more shows. And uh, we couldn't because it was... Uh... Well, do you remember right after that show, we, we were packing up all of our equipment and Brad had basically devoted all of his car to all of his keyboards and his mic mixer or, or his mixer and all this stuff. Right. So we, he was parked right outside CBGB's. We loaded his car up and he drove straight from CBGB's back to Indianapolis mm-hmm. that night uh-huh. because he had to be to work the next, the next morning. Oh, man. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so we played That's our. That's gotten it close. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're telling. So we played our Hoboken us. show without Brad. Right. That was a Bradless show. But it was still a great show and well attended. Well, of course, and, it was no, an excellent no, show. No, no, no. It was just a. But anyway, that uh, that performance is now available on the CD, and if you buy the LP, the CD is also it's included a, it's a as well. Bonus it's CD a bonus. in there. Yeah. Why would anybody buy the CD if you can just get the CD free with it's the album? It's a lot cheaper. Yeah, the, the vinyl and the CD is more expensive, and the vinyl is on a beautiful, beautiful clear C- Coke, Coke bottle. bottle, clear green, really? and yeah, and we had a. Ch- Do you have one ch- open? I can look at. We'll here in a second, and we had a uh, choice of colors, and we kind of really couldn't decide, and so. As bizarre as it may seem, we have a really strong uh, fan base in in Canada, huh. and I asked uh, my buddy uh, Dominic. I said, "Here's our color choices. What do you suggest?" And he said, "Didn't even hesitate. Coke bottle green." So Coke bottle green is uh, is dedicated to a, a big last four digits fan up in uh, Montreal, and uh, his name is Dominic. So yeah, everything was digitally remastered from the original Dave master did a, tapes. Dave did a great job mastering, Thank given you. the fact that we just had a two track to work with, and everything sounds really, really wonderful. Uh, coming out on Secretly Canadian well, and, Records, and Tony, you have you have followed the various bands that Mike and I have been in. How would you describe and been in some of them? <laughs> how would you describe uh, what the the last four digits sound sounded like? Well, I think, like I said earlier, it's been so long since I've heard any of those songs. I honestly don't know. Um, if my memories would be as uh, as uh, accurate, I mean, hell, it was like thirty years ago, right? Yeah. So, well, I still remember Per Ubu at, at at Gaspers in yeah, Chicago. Yeah, yeah. I think I, around that period, I probably drank and did a lot of acid, so my memories probably aren't as clear. All right. Well, maybe you can. Maybe you I can, remember liking the songs, and, I, and dro- I would bet I could sing along with most of them. Maybe you could drop one of the songs in at the end of the podcast. I was thinking I might do that. You would have our permission. All right. It's really funny that, uh, speaking of Dominic, uh, he is, uh, when I first uh, made contact with him, he said that uh, City Streets was his one of his favorite songs. And he had heard it uh, on a compilation. Well, you know, there's something. really not a bad song on the album. But but to have someone well, of course. In, in Canada who's easily... Probably twenty years younger than myself. Lots of shiny and, objects, and to he's look at. he's not the only one. He said there are people up there that just love Indiana punk and new wave, the Dow Jones and the Gizmos and and everything else. And we also want to say, you know, we're looking at uh, at Billy Nightshade up in heaven, looking down upon us. We have uh, we lost a a great person yeah. from the Gizmos. <clears throat> Do you remember when uh, Cheap Trick was like the band in Japan? That they oh, had sure. phenomenal success there. Yeah, I want to be the number one band in. 
Serbia. That is my, really? my goal. Yeah. Well, huh. I want I want somebody in Serbia to say, we like these people. We need to bring them here for a concert tour. Really? You think Coughing Up Blood will be their favorite song? Oh, who wouldn't like that? <laughs> <You're dumb. laughs> Which, uh, when we played it live in... Uh, New York. It happened to be uh, Feb- happened to be February fourteenth, which is Valentine's Day, and, and Dave, being the witty gentleman he is, I'm coughing on your armistice. <laughs> I'm he, coughing on your Fourth of July. He, he 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 whipped off every holiday that you could possibly imagine, <laughs> ending in a climax of coughing up blood on well, your Valentine. It's always good to end in a climax. Yeah. yeah. Well, speaking of ending with a climax, this now is about one minute shy of two hours. Wow. And I said that I would never do another two-hour podcast again. Would be that in- interesting or, or... Oh, oh, compelling is not even the word I'd want to use. Compelling is not the word he is going to use. Uh, <laughs> Note folks, to self. Focus straight on target. I mean... Yeah, uh, you know, invite us back. We'll tell you what we really think. Well, okay. Will that take two hours as well? At least. All right. Well, okay, that's anything. Any last words? Thank you for having we us. We want to thank you for uh, letting us do it. Um, <clears throat> the, what, talk about moments. I remember handing uh, Lydia Lunch a copy of Red Snurts and telling her how he dedicated uh, Diddy Wah Diddy to George Scott. And she was like totally, <laughs> totally enamored oh. with that. And so just, just kind of a, a moment to tie one of which that track is on our. Uh, Album that's right, CD. Diddy, Wah, Diddy. I think that's one of the best tracks on there. Right, and you're saying people should look early June. Uh, no, late June, early July. Secretly Canadian is putting it out, putting out all kinds of. They put out all kinds of great stuff. So, is that what Rick's label's called? No, no, his label's no. Time Change Records. Okay, right, but Secretly Canadian Secretly is, is the distributor. distributor. But oh, wow. no, okay, I, yeah. So yeah, Time Rick, Change Rick is the label. Secretly okay. is the distributor. Time right. Change Records. And Thank you, Rick. They have a big client base in Serbia. If yeah. you're listening to this and you're in Serbia, thank you, Rick. Yes, thank you, Rick. Well, okay. I mean, I, 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 although I think you know, you, you might do a little better over there if you did a couple of songs about how much you hate the Croats. <laughs> <laughs> I think those those might rocket to number one. You, Ukraine would work too. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Ukraine Crimea or a river. <laughs> <laughs> oh. On that note, all right. Let's end it there. <laughs>